The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, a spiritual fable about fulfilling your dreams and reaching your destiny. Read by Robin S. Sharma. The wake-up call. He collapsed right in the middle of a packed courtroom. He was one of this country's most distinguished trial lawyers. He was also a man well known for the $3,000 Italian suits which draped his well-fed frame as for his remarkable string of legal victories. I simply stood there, paralyzed by the shock of what I had just witnessed. The great Julian Mantle had been reduced to a victim and was now squirming on the ground like a helpless infant shaking and shivering like a maniac. I had known Julian for 17 years. We had first met when I was a young law student hired as a summer research intern. Back then, he'd had it all. He was a brilliant, handsome, and fearless trial attorney with dreams of greatness. Julian was the firm's young star. He was tough, hard-driving, and willing to work 18-hour days for the success he believed was his destiny. Julian's outrageous courtroom theatrics regularly made the front pages of the newspapers. His extracurricular activities were probably as well known. Late night visits to the city's finest restaurants with sexy young fashion models or reckless drinking escapades became the stuff of legend. I still can't figure out why he picked me to work with him on that sensational murder case he was to argue that first summer. Though I had graduated from Harvard Law School, his alma mater, I certainly wasn't the brightest intern at the firm. At Julian's invitation, I stayed on at the firm as an associate, and a lasting friendship quickly developed between us. I will admit that he wasn't the easiest lawyer to work with. Serving as his junior was often an exercise in frustration, leading to more than a few late-night shouting matches. However, beneath his crusty exterior was a person who clearly cared about people. No matter how busy he was, he would always ask about Jenny, the woman I still call my bride. On finding out that I was in a financial squeeze, Julian arranged for me to receive a generous scholarship. Sure, he could play hardball with the best of them, but he never neglected his friends. The real problem was that Julian was obsessed with work. For the first few years, he justified his long hours by saying that he was doing it for the good of the firm. As time passed, Julian's reputation for brilliance spread and his workload continued to increase. In his rare moments of quiet, confided that he could no longer sleep for more than a couple of hours without waking up feeling guilty that he was not working on a file. It soon became clear to me that he was being consumed by the hunger for more. More prestige, more glory, and more money. As expected, Julian became enormously successful. He achieved everything most people could ever want. A stellar professional reputation with an income in seven figures, a spectacular mansion, a private jet, and his prized possession, a shiny red Ferrari parked in the center of his driveway. At 53 years of age, Julian looked as if he was in his late 70s. His face was a mass of wrinkles, a less than glorious tribute to his take-no-prisoners approach to life in general and to the tremendous stress of his out-of-balance lifestyle in particular. His late-night dinners in expensive French restaurants, smoking thick Cuban cigars and drinking cognac after cognac had left him embarrassingly overweight. He constantly complained that he was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Julian's once enthusiastic nature had been replaced by a deathly somberness. Personally, I think that his life had lost all sense of purpose. Almost every day he would tell me that he felt no passion for what he was doing and was enveloped by emptiness. Julian said that as a young lawyer, he really loved the law. The law's complexities and intellectual challenges had kept him spellbound and full of energy. Its power to affect social change inspired and motivated him. That vision gave his life meaning. It gave him a purpose and it fueled his hopes. There was even more to Julian's undoing than a rusty connection to what he did for a living. He had suffered some great tragedy before I had joined the firm. Something truly unspeakable had happened to him but I couldn't get anyone to open up about it. Whatever this deep, dark secret was, I had a suspicion that it in some way was contributing to Julian's downward spiral. Sure, I was curious, but most of all, I wanted to help him. He was not only my mentor, he was my best friend. And then it happened. This massive heart attack brought the brilliant Julian Mantle back down to earth 
and reconnected him to his mortality. The Mysterious Visitor It was an emergency meeting of all of the firm's members. Old man Harding was the first to speak to the assembled mass. I'm afraid I have some very bad news. Julian Mantle suffered a severe heart attack in court yesterday. He is currently in the intensive care unit but his physicians have informed me that his condition is now stabilized and he will recover. However, Julian has made a decision to leave our family and to give up his law practice. He will not be returning to the firm. I was shocked. I knew he was having his share of troubles, but I never thought he would quit. As well, after all we had been through, I thought he would at least have the courtesy to tell me this personally. He wouldn't even see me at the hospital. Maybe I reminded him of the life he wanted to forget. Who knows? I'll tell you one thing though, it hurt. That whole episode was just over three years ago. Last I heard, Julian had headed off to India on some kind of expedition. He told one of the partners that he wanted to simplify his life and that he needed some answers and hoped he would find them in that mystical land. He sold his mansion and his plane. He had even sold his Ferrari. As those three years passed, I changed from an overworked young lawyer to a jaded, somewhat cynical older lawyer. My wife Jenny and I had a family. Eventually I began my own search for meaning. I think it was having kids that did it. My dad said it best when he said, John, on your deathbed you will never wish you spent more time at the office. So I started spending a little bit more time at home. I settled into a pretty good, if ordinary, existence. I joined the Rotary Club and played golf on Saturdays to keep my partners and clients happy. But I must tell you, in my quiet moments, I often thought of Julian. No one had received even a postcard from him since he left for his self-imposed exile from the law. A knock on my door about two months ago offered the first answers to some of my questions. I had just met with my last client on a grueling day when Genevieve, my brainy legal assistant, popped her head into my office. There's someone here to see you, John. He says it's urgent, and he will not leave until he speaks with you. For an instant, I considered calling security, but realizing that this might be someone in need, I assumed a more forgiving posture. Okay, send him in. I probably could use the business anyway. The door to my office opened slowly. At last it swung fully open, revealing a smiling man in his mid-thirties. He was tall, lean, and muscular, radiating an abundance of vitality and energy. But there was more to my visitor than his youthful good looks. An underlying peacefulness gave him an almost divine presence. And his eyes, piercing blue eyes that sliced clear through me. The young man continued to look at me, much as the smiling Buddha might have looked upon a favored pupil. After a long moment of uncomfortable silence, he spoke in a surprisingly commanding tone. Is this how you treat all of your visitors, John? He said, his full lips curling into a mighty grin. A strange sensation tickled the pit of my stomach. Julian, is that you? I can't believe it. Is it really you? The loud laugh of the visitor confirmed my suspicions. The young man standing before me was none other than that long lost yogi of India, Julian Mantle. I was dazzled by his incredible transformation. Gone was the ghost-like complexion, the sickly cough, and the lifeless eyes of my former colleague. Perhaps even more astounding was the serenity that Julian exuded. I felt entirely peaceful just sitting there staring at him. The man before me was a youthful, vital, and smiling model of change. The Miraculous Transformation of Julian Mantle Julian was the first to speak. He admitted that his body had fallen apart and that his mind had lost its luster. The constant pressure and exhausting schedule of a world-class trial lawyer had also broken his most important and perhaps most human endowment, his spirit. When given the ultimatum by his doctor either to give up the law or give up his life, he said he saw a golden opportunity to rekindle the inner fire that he had known when he was younger. Julian grew visibly excited as he recounted how he sold all his material possessions and headed for India a land whose ancient culture and mystical traditions had always fascinated him. He traveled from tiny village to tiny village, seeing the timeless sights and growing to love the Indian people. Julian slowly began to feel alive 
and whole again, perhaps for the first time since he was a child. His natural curiosity and creative spark steadily returned, along with his enthusiasm and his energy for living. He started to feel more joyful and peaceful, and he began to laugh again. Julian told me that his journey to India was more than a simple vacation. He described his time as a personal odyssey of the self. He confided that he was determined to find out who he really was and what his life was all about. To do this, his first priority was to connect to that culture's vast pool of ancient wisdom on living a more rewarding, fulfilling, and enlightened life. The more he explored, the more he heard of Indian monks who had lived beyond the age of a hundred. Monks who, despite their advanced years, maintained youthful, energetic, and vital lives. The more he traveled, the more he learned of ageless yogis who had mastered the art of mind control and spiritual awakening. It was while he was in Kashmir, an ancient and mystical state that sits sleepily at the foot of the Himalayas, that he had the good fortune to meet a gentleman named Yogi Krishnan. This slight man with a clean-shaven head had also been a lawyer. Fed up with his hectic pace that personifies modern New Delhi, he too gave up his material possessions and retreated to a world of greater simplicity. Becoming a caretaker of the village temple, Krishnan said he had come to know himself and his purpose in the larger scheme of life. Julian informed this lawyer turned yogi of his own story. I need your help, Krishnan. I need to learn how to build a richer, fuller life. For as long as I have been caring for this temple, I have heard whisperings of a mystical band of sages living high in the Himalayas. Legend has it that they have discovered some sort of system that will profoundly improve the quality of anyone's life. It is supposed to be a holistic, integrated set of ageless principles and timeless techniques to liberate the potential of the mind, body, and soul. Julian was fascinated. This seemed perfect. Just exactly where do these monks live? No one knows, and I regret that I am too old to start searching. But I will tell you one thing, my friend. Many have tried to find them, and many have failed. The higher reaches of the Himalayas are treacherous beyond consequences. But if it is the golden keys to radiant health, lasting happiness, and inner fulfillment that you are searching for, I do not have the wisdom you seek. They do. Are you certain that you have no idea where they live? All I can tell you is that the locals in this village know them as the great sages of Savana. In their mythology, Savana means oasis of enlightenment. These monks are revered as if they are divine in their constitution and influence. If I knew where they could be found, I would be duty bound to tell you. The next morning, Julian set out to the lost land of Savana. The first few days were easy. Sometimes he would catch up to one of the cheerful citizens of the village walking on one of the footpaths. At other times, he hiked alone. The majesty of the snow-capped peaks of the Himalayas made his heart beat faster, and for one moment took his breath away. The fresh mountain air cleared his mind and energized his spirit. At once he felt joyous, exhilarated, and carefree. It was here, high above the humanity below, that Julian slowly ventured out of the cocoon of the ordinary and began to explore the realm of the extraordinary. It was while he was soaking in the gifts of nature's intelligence that something startling happened. From the corner of his eye he saw another figure, dressed strangely in a long, flowing red robe, topped by a dark blue hood slightly ahead of him on the path. Julian was astonished to see anyone in this isolated spot that had taken him seven treacherous days to reach. He yelled out to his fellow traveler. The figure refused to respond and accelerated his pace along the path they were both climbing. Soon the mysterious traveler was running, his red robe dancing gracefully behind him. Please, friend, I need your help to find Savannah, yelled Julian. I've been traveling for seven days with little food and water. I think I'm lost. The figure came to an abrupt stop. Julian approached cautiously while the traveler stood remarkably still and silent. His head did not move, his hands did not move, and his feet kept their place. Julian gazed at the traveler with an intense curiosity. A quick burst of a sunbeam revealed that it was a man's face under the loosely fitting hood. Though he was at least his own age, there were very striking features of this person which left Julian mesmerized. His eyes were cat-like 
and so penetrating that Julian was forced to look away. His olive-complexioned skin was supple and smooth. His body looked strong and powerful. And though the man's hands gave away the fact that he was not young, he radiated an abundance of youthfulness and vitality. I am Julian Mantle. I have come to learn from the sages of Savannah. Do you know where I might find them? The man spoke softly. Why is it that you seek these sages, friend? Sensing that he had indeed found one of the mystical monks who had eluded so many, Julian opened his heart and poured out his odyssey to the traveler. He spoke of his former life and of the crisis of spirit he had struggled with, and he told of his travels in mystical India and of his meeting with Yogi Krishnan. The traveler remained silent and still. It was not until Julian spoke of his burning, almost obsessive desire to acquire the ancient principles of enlightened living that the man spoke again. Placing an arm on Julian's shoulder, the man said gently, If you truly have a heartfelt desire to learn the wisdom of a better way, then it is my duty to help you. I am indeed one of those sages that you have come so far in search of. If you like, you may come with me as my guest to our temple. My brothers and sisters will welcome you with open arms. We will work together to teach you the ancient principles and strategies that our ancestors have passed down through the ages. Before I take you into our private world, I must request one promise from you. Upon learning these timeless truths, you must return to your homeland in the West and share this wisdom with all those who need to hear it. Though we are isolated in these magical mountains, we are aware of the turmoil your world is in. Good people are losing their way. You must give them the hope that they deserve. More importantly, you must give them the tools to fulfill their dreams. This is all I ask. Julian instantly accepted the sage's terms. As the two men moved still higher up the mountain path to the lost village of Savannah, the Indian sun started to set, a fiery red circle slipping into a soft, magical slumber after a long and weary day. A Magical Meeting with the Sages of Savannah After walking for many hours, the two travelers came upon a lush green valley. On one side of the valley, the snow-capped Himalayas offered their protection. On the other, a thick forest of pine trees spreaded. The sage looked at Julian and smiled gently. Welcome to the Nirvana of Savannah. The two then descended into the thick forest which formed the floor of the valley. The smell of pine and sandalwood wafted through the cool, crisp mountain air. Julian, now barefoot to ease his aching feet, felt the damp moss under his toes. He was surprised to see the richly colored orchids and a host of other lovely flowers dancing among the trees. After walking for about 15 more minutes, the two men reached a clearing. Before him was a sight that even the worldly wise and rarely surprised Julian Mantle could never have imagined. A small village made solely out of what appeared to be roses. At the center of the village was a tiny temple made of red, white, and pink flowers held together with long strands of multicolored string and twigs. The little huts which dotted the remaining space appeared to be the austere homes of the sages. These were also made of roses. Julian was speechless. Julian's traveling companion now revealed that his name was Yogi Raman. He explained that he was the eldest sage of Savannah and the leader of the group. The citizens of this dreamlike colony looked astonishingly youthful and moved with poise and purpose. None of them spoke, choosing instead to respect the tranquility of this place by performing their tasks in silence. The men, who appeared to number only about ten, wore the same red-robed uniform as Yogi Raman and smiled serenely at Julian. Each of them looked calm, healthy, and deeply contented. The women were equally impressive. In their flowing pink silk saris and with white lotuses adorning their jet black hair, they moved busily through the village with exceptional agility. With zen-like focus, some worked inside the temple, preparing for what appeared to be a festival. Others carried firewood and richly embroidered tapestries. All were engaged in productive activity. All appeared to be happy. Ultimately, the faces of the sages of Savannah revealed the power of their way of life. Even though they were clearly mature adults, 
Each one of them radiated a childlike quality, their eyes twinkling with the vitality of youth. Not one of them had wrinkles. Not one of them had gray hair. Not one of them looked old. Julian was offered a feast of fresh vegetables and fruits, a diet that he would later learn was one of the keys to the ideal health enjoyed by the sages. After the meal, Yogi Raman escorted Julian to his living quarters, a flower-filled hut containing a small bed with an empty journal pad on it. This would be his home for the foreseeable future. Though Julian had never seen anything like this magical world of Savannah, his intuition told him that he belonged here, if only for a short period. And so began Julian's life among the sages of Savannah, a life of simplicity, serenity, and harmony. The best was soon to come. A Spiritual Student of the Sages It was now 8 p.m., and I still had to prepare for court the next day. Yet I was fascinated by the experience of this former legal warrior. The longer I listened to Julian, the more I came to realize that my own spirit had become rusty. What had happened to the uncommon passion I brought to everything I did when I was younger? Maybe it was time for me to reinvent my destiny. Julian quickened the pace as he continued with his tale. He told me how his desire for knowledge, coupled with his sharp intellect, had made him a well-loved member of the Savannah community. As a mark of their affection for Julian, the monks eventually made him an honorary member of their band and treated him like an integral part of their extended family. Eager to expand his knowledge of the workings of the mind, body, and soul, and to attain self-mastery, Julian spent literally every waking moment under the tutelage of Yogi Raman. The sage became more like a father to Julian than a teacher. It was clear that this man had the accumulated wisdom of many lifetimes, and most happily, he was willing to share it with Julian. Beginning before dawn, Yogi Raman would sit with his enthusiastic student and fill his mind with insights on the meaning of life and little-known techniques for living with greater vitality, creativity, and fulfillment. He taught Julian ancient principles anyone could use to live longer, stay younger, and grow far happier. Julian also learned how the twin disciplines of personal mastery and self-responsibility would keep him from returning to the chaos of crises that had characterized his life in the West. Julian said that the first indications of his personal expansion came after only three weeks in Savannah. He also said that his new lifestyle and the new habits associated with it started to have a profound effect on his inner world. Within a month of applying the principles and techniques of the sages, he had begun to cultivate the deep sense of peace and inner serenity that had eluded him. He became more joyful and spontaneous, growing more energetic and creative with each passing day. After pausing as if to express disbelief at his own tale, Julian grew philosophical. I've realized that the world, and that includes my inner world, is a very special place. I have learned that self-mastery and the consistent care for one's mind, body, and soul are essential to finding one's highest self and living the life of one's dreams. How can you care for others if you cannot even care for yourself? I can't love you if I cannot love myself, he offered. Suddenly, Julian grew flustered. I have never opened my heart to anyone like this before. It is just that I experienced such a catharsis up in those mountains, such a spiritual awakening to the powers of the universe, that I feel others need to know what I know. Noticing it was getting late, Julian quickly told me he would take his leave and bid me adieu. I'll be back, my friend. You have your work to do, and I have some private matters that need to be taken care of. Just tell me one thing. Will the methods you learned in Savannah work for me? When the student is ready, the teacher appears, came the swift reply. You, along with so many others, are ready for the wisdom I now have the privilege of holding. I will meet you again tomorrow night, this time at your house. Then I'll tell you all you need to know to put far more living into your life. And with that, the master litigator turned enlightened yogi of the East was gone. The Wisdom of Personal Change True to his word, Julian showed up at my house the next evening. He still embodied radiant health and exuded a wonderful sense of calm. It was what he was wearing that made me a little uncomfortable. 
Adorning his obviously supple body was a long red robe topped by an ornately embroidered blue hood. Greetings, my friend, Julian offered enthusiastically. Greetings. Don't look so alarmed. What did you expect me to wear? Armani? We both started to laugh, softly at first. Soon our giggles had turned into guffaws. Julian certainly had not lost that wicked sense of humor. As we relaxed in my cluttered but comfortable living room, I couldn't help but notice the ornate necklace of wooden prayer beads dangling from his neck. What are those? They're really beautiful. More about these later, he said. We have much to talk about tonight. Let's get started. I could hardly get anything done at work today. I was so excited about our meeting. Julian immediately started to reveal more about his personal transformation and the ease with which it was affected. He told me of the ancient techniques he had learned for mind control and for erasing the habit of worry. Though the conviction with which he spoke was clear, I began to grow skeptical. Was I the victim of some prank? This could not be real. Come on, Julian, stop pulling my leg. This whole story is starting to smack of one of your gags, I suggested, breaking into my best fear grin. Julian remained calm and patient. Spotting the pot of tea I had left on the table next to him, he started to pour into my waiting cup. He poured until the cup was full, but then he kept on pouring. Tea started to trickle down the sides of the cup and into the saucer. Julian, what are you doing? My cup is overflowing. No matter how hard you try, no more will go in. He looked at me for a long moment. Please don't take this the wrong way. I really respect you, John. However, just like this cup, you seem full of your own ideas. And how can any more go in until you first empty your cup? I was struck by the truth of his words. My many years in the conservative legal world, doing the same things every day with the same people who thought the same thoughts every day, had filled my cup to the brim. Okay, I see your point, I admitted. Perhaps all my years as a trial lawyer have made me a hardened skeptic. From the minute I saw you yesterday, something deep inside me told me that your transformation was genuine. Maybe I just didn't want to believe it. John, tonight is the first night of your new life. I simply ask that you think deeply about the wisdom and strategies that I will share with you and apply them with conviction for a period of one month. You will experience changes within the workings of your mind, body, and even your soul that will astonish you. A lasting sense of well-being and balance will swiftly return to your life. Wow! The advice of the sages is just as current today as it was 5,000 years ago. It will not only enrich your inner world, it will enhance your outer world and make you far more effective in all that you do. Most importantly, it will work for anyone. But before I share this knowledge with you, I must ask you for a promise. Once you see the power of the strategies and skills shown to me by the sages of Savannah, you must make it your mission to pass this wisdom on to others who will benefit from this knowledge. By agreeing to do this, you will help me fulfill my own pact with Yogi Raman. I agreed without reservation. Julian began to teach me the system he had come to consider as sacred. At the heart of the Savannah system were seven basic virtues, seven fundamental principles which embodied the keys to self-leadership, personal responsibility, and spiritual enlightenment. Julian told me that Yogi Raman was the first to share the seven virtues with him after a few months in Savannah. On a clear night, Raman knocked softly on the door of Julian's hut. In the voice of a gentle guide, he spoke his mind. Since you have arrived, you have opened yourself up to our traditions and embraced them as your own. Tonight, on the eve of your third month in Savannah, I will begin to share the inner workings of our system with you, not only for your benefit, but for the benefit of all those in your part of the world. I feel grateful that all I have learned over many years of silent contemplation will live within you. I looked at Julian and noticed that his eyes were now shut, as if he were transporting himself back to this fairy tale land that had showered the blessing of knowledge on him. Yogi Raman told me that the seven virtues for a life overflowing with inner peace, joy, and a wealth of spiritual gifts were contained within a mystical fable. This fable was the essence of it all. He asked me to shut my eyes, as I have now done, here on the floor of your living room. He then told me to picture the following scene in my mind's eye. 
you are sitting in the middle of a magnificent, lush green garden. This garden is filled with the most spectacular flowers you have ever seen. The environment is supremely tranquil and silent. Savor the sensual delights of this garden and feel as if you have all the time in the world to enjoy this natural oasis. As you look around, you see that in the center of this magical garden stands a towering red lighthouse, six stories high. Suddenly, the silence of the garden is disturbed by a loud creaking as the door at the base of the lighthouse opens. Out stumbles a nine-foot-tall, 900-pound Japanese sumo wrestler who casually wanders into the center of the garden. It gets better, chuckled Jillian. The Japanese sumo wrestler is naked. Well, actually, he's not totally naked. He has a pink wire cable covering his private parts. As the sumo wrestler starts to move around the garden, he finds a shiny gold stopwatch which someone had left behind many years earlier. He slips on it and falls to the ground with an enormous thud. The sumo wrestler is rendered unconscious and lies there, silent and still. Just when you think he has taken his last breath, the wrestler awakens, stirred by the fragrance of some fresh yellow roses blooming nearby. Energized, the wrestler jumps swiftly to his feet and intuitively looks to his left. He is startled by what he sees. Through the bushes at the very edge of the garden, he observes a long winding path covered by millions of sparkling diamonds. Something seems to instruct the wrestler to take the path, and to his credit, he does. This path leads him down the road of everlasting joy and eternal bliss. After hearing this strange tale, Julian told me he was disappointed. He had expected to hear something earth-shattering, wisdom that would stir him to action and perhaps even move him to tears. Yogi Raman detected this and said, at first it might seem to be frivolous and perhaps even childish, but I assure you that every element of the fable embodies a timeless principle for radiant living and has great depth of meaning. The garden, the lighthouse, the sumo wrestler, the pink wire cable, the stopwatch, the roses, and the winding path of diamonds are symbols of the seven timeless virtues for an enlightened life. I can also assure you that if you remember this little story and the fundamental truths that it represents, you will carry within you all that you need to know to raise your life to its highest level. You will have all the information and strategies you will need to profoundly influence the quality of your life and the lives of all those you touch. And when you apply this wisdom on a daily basis, you will change mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. A Most Extraordinary Garden In the fable, the garden is a symbol for the mind, said Julian. If you care for your mind, if you nurture it and cultivate it, just like a fertile, rich garden, it will blossom far beyond your expectations. But if you let the weeds take root, lasting peace of mind and deep inner harmony will always elude you. Look at the toxic waste that most people put into the fertile garden of their minds every single day. The worries and anxieties, the fretting about the past, the brooding over the future, and those self-created fears that wreak havoc within your inner world. Worry drains the mind of much of its power, and sooner or later, it injures the soul. To live life to the fullest, you must stand guard at the gate of the garden of your mind and let only the best information enter. You truly can't afford the luxury of a negative thought, not even one. The most joyful, dynamic, and contented people of this world are no different from you or me in terms of their makeup. However, the ones who do more than just exist, the ones who fan the flames of their human potential and truly savor the magical dance of life, do different things than those whose lives are ordinary. Foremost among the things they do is adopt a positive paradigm about their world and all that is in it. The way you think stems from habit, pure and simple, Julian continued with conviction. I have learned that even the best conditioned thinkers are using only one one-hundredth of one percent of their mental reserves. In Savannah, the sages dared to explore the untapped potential of their mental capacity on a regular basis, and the results were astounding. Yogi Raman through regular and disciplined practice, had conditioned his mind so that he was able to slow down his heartbeat at will. He had even trained himself to go for weeks without sleep. 
While I would never suggest that these should be goals for you to aspire to, I do suggest that you start to see your mind for what it is, nature's greatest gift. My teacher was growing more excited by the moment. His eyes seemed to twinkle as he spoke of the magic of the mind and the wealth of goodness it would surely bring. There is no such thing as objective reality or the real world. There are no absolutes. An event that appears to be a tragedy to one might reveal the seeds of unlimited opportunity to another. What really separates people who are habitually upbeat and optimistic from those who are consistently miserable is how the circumstances of their life are interpreted and processed. And it all starts with using your mind more effectively? Exactly, John. All success in life, whether material or spiritual, starts with that 12-pound mass sitting between your shoulders. Your outer world reflects the state of your inner world. By controlling the thoughts that you think and the way you respond to the events of your life, you begin to control your destiny. This makes so much sense, Julian. I guess my life has become so busy that I have never taken the time to think about these things. When I was in law school, my best friend Alex used to love reading inspirational books. He said that they kept him motivated and energized in the face of our crushing workload. I remember him telling me that one of them said that the Chinese character for crisis is comprised of two sub-characters, one that spells danger and another that spells opportunity. I guess that even the ancient Chinese knew that there is a bright side to the darkest circumstance if you have the courage to look for it. Yogi Raman put it this way, there are no mistakes in life, only lessons. There is no such thing as a negative experience, only opportunities to grow, learn, and advance along the road of self-mastery. From struggle comes strength. Even pain can be a wonderful teacher. Pain, I protested. Absolutely. To transcend pain, you must first experience it. Or to put it another way, how can you really know the joy of being on the summit of the mountain unless you have first visited the lowest valley? Get my point? To savor the good one must know the bad? Yes, but I suggest that you stop judging events as either positive or negative. Rather, simply experience them, celebrate them, and learn from them. Once you consistently apply this principle to your daily life and start to condition your mind to translate the mind and then, and only then, in reality. I call the process blueprinting because anything you create in your outer world began as a simple blueprint in your inner world on the lush picture screen of your mind. When you learn to take control of your thoughts and vividly imagine every event into a positive, empowering one, you will banish worry forever. You will stop being a prisoner of your past. Instead, you will become the architect of your future. Okay, I understand the concept. What else might a humble, middle-class lawyer do to improve things? First of all, begin to live out of the glory of your imagination, not your memory. Run that one by me again? You see, things are always created twice. First in the workshop, imagine all that you desire from this worldly existence in a state of total expectancy. Dormant forces will awaken inside you. You will begin to unlock the true potential of your mind to create the kind of magical life that I believe you deserve. From tonight onwards, forget about the past. Dare to dream that you are more than the sum of your current circumstances. Expect the best you will be astonished at the results. I began to reflect on my own life. When I was a kid, I dreamed such great dreams. Often, I visualized myself as a sports hero or a business tycoon. I really believed that I could do, have, or be whatever I wanted to be. There were no limits on what my future could bring. I honestly don't think I felt that kind of freedom and joy for 15 years. What happened? Perhaps I lost sight of my dream when I became an adult and resigned myself to acting the way adults were supposed to act. Maybe I lost sight of them when I went to law school and started talking like lawyers were supposed to talk. In any event, that evening with Julian at my side made me resolve to stop spending so much time making a living and to spend far more time creating a life. Looks like I have you thinking about your life also, Julian observed. Start thinking about your dreams for a change, just like when you were a little child. Start to revere life again and celebrate all of its wonders. Julian then reached into the depths of his robe and pulled out a little card. One day, while Yogi Raman and I were walking along a quiet mountain path, I asked him who his favorite philosopher was. 
He told me that he had many influences in his life and it was difficult for him to single out any one source for his inspiration. There was one quotation, however, that encapsulated all the values he had come to cherish over a life spent in quiet contemplation. The words came from the great Indian philosopher Patanjali. Repeating them aloud every morning before I sit down to meditate has had a profound influence on the course of my day. Julian then showed me the card. The quotation read, When you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all of your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction and you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties, and talents become alive, and you discover yourself to be a greater person than you ever dreamed yourself to be. In that instant, I saw the connection between physical vitality and mental agility. Julian was in picture-perfect health and looked many years younger than he had when we had first met. Success on the outside indeed begins with success on the inside, and by changing his thoughts, Julian had changed his life. Exactly how can I develop this positive, serene, and inspired attitude, Julian? After all these years in my routine, I think my mental muscles have grown a little flabby, I said with sincerity. If you diligently apply the strategies I am sharing with you every day for only one month, you will be astonished at the results. You will begin to tap into the highest levels of your own capacity and enter the realm of the miraculous. But to reach this destination, you must not get hung up on the outcome. Instead, enjoy the process of personal expansion and growth. Julian added softly, Before I give you the precise methods passed on to me by the sages of Savannah, I must first share a couple of key principles. First, always remember that concentration is at the root of mental mastery. The very fact that you have a desire or a dream means that you have the corresponding capacity to realize it. However, to liberate the power of the mind, you must first be able to harness it and direct its focus only to the task at hand. The moment you concentrate the focus of your mind on a singular purpose, extraordinary gifts will appear within your life. How about eternal happiness? Go big or stay home, he chuckled. Nothing like starting off small. Well, you can have that too. The secret of happiness is simple. Find out what you truly love to do and then direct all of your energy towards doing it. Once you're concentrating your mind power and energy on a pursuit that you love, abundance flows into your life and all your desires are fulfilled with ease and grace. So simply figure out what turns you on and then do it? If it is a worthy pursuit, Julian replied, your passion must, in some way, improve or serve the lives of others. Once you find out what your life's work is, your world will come alive. You will wake up every morning with a limitless reservoir of energy and enthusiasm. All your thoughts will be focused on your definite objective. You will automatically erase the worry habit and become far more effective and productive. Interestingly, you will also have a deep sense of inner harmony, as if you are somehow being guided to realize your mission. It is a wonderful feeling. I love it, Julian offered gleefully. Fascinating. And I like the part about getting up feeling good. To be really honest with you, Julian, most days I wish I could just stay under the covers. Do you know why most people sleep so much? Because they really don't have anything else to do. Those who rise with the sun all have one thing in common. They all have a purpose that fans the flames of their inner potential. They are driven by their priorities, but not in an unhealthy, obsessive way. It's more effortless and gentle than that. And given their enthusiasm and love for what they are doing in their lives, such people live in the moment. Their attention is fully and completely on the task at hand. Therefore, there are no energy leaks. These people are the most vibrant and vital individuals you will ever have the good fortune to meet. Energy leaks? Sounds a little new agey, Julian. I'll bet you didn't learn that one at Harvard Law School. True, the sages of Savannah pioneered that concept. Though it has been around for centuries, its application is just as relevant today. Too many of us are consumed by needless and endless worry. Worry causes your precious mental energy and potential to leak. Soon, you have no energy left. Once you find your purpose, however, 
life becomes much easier and far more rewarding. When you figure out what your main aim or destiny really is, your work will be play. Wouldn't it be a little risky for me to give up my job to start searching for my overriding passion and purpose? I mean, I have a family and real obligations. I have four people who depend on me. I'm not saying that you have to leave the legal profession tomorrow. You will, however, have to start taking risks. Most people live within the confines of their comfort zone. Yogi Raman was the first to explain that the best thing you can do for yourself is to regularly move beyond it. This is the way to lasting personal mastery and the realization of the true potential of your human endowments. And what might those be? Your mind, your body, and your soul. So what risks should I take? Stop being so practical. Start doing the things you have always wanted to do. I have known lawyers who have quit their jobs to become stage actors and accountants who have become jazz musicians. In the process, they have found the deep happiness that had eluded them for so long. Calculated risk-taking will pay huge dividends. I see your point. So take the time to think. The sages of Savannah all took time daily to silently contemplate not only where they were, but where they were going. They took the time to reflect on their purpose and how they were living their lives every day. Most importantly, they thought deeply and genuinely about how they would improve the next day. Daily incremental improvements produce lasting results which in turn lead to positive change. Even 10 minutes of focused reflection a day will have a profound impact on the quality of your life. Hey, you were going to share some techniques with me, Julian, I said, hoping to learn some practical ways to apply the wisdom I was hearing. There is one technique for mastering the mind which towers above all the rest. After practicing it for only 21 days, I felt more energy. But you need not worry. Improvement will come quickly. Simply return your attention to the object of your focus. Soon your mind will grow strong and disciplined. That's all there is to it? it sounds pretty easy. That's the beauty of it, John, Julian replied. Energetic, enthusiastic, and vibrant that I had in years. The practice is over 4,000 years old. It's called the heart of the rose. All that you need to perform this exercise is a fresh rose in a silent place. Natural surroundings are best, but a quiet room will do nicely. Start to stare at the center of the rose, its heart. Keep staring at the rose. Notice its color, its texture, its design. Savor its fragrance and think only about this wonderful object in front of you. At first, other thoughts will start entering your mind, distracting you from the heart of the rose. This is the mark of an untrained mind. However, this ritual must be performed daily for it to be effective. For the first few days, you will find it difficult to spend even five minutes in this exercise. Persist and spend longer and longer periods savoring the heart of the rose. After a week or two, you should be able to perform the technique for 20 minutes without your mind wandering to other subjects. This will be the first indication that you are taking back control of the fortress of your mind. Practically speaking, you will notice that you will feel far calmer. You will have taken a significant step towards erasing the worry habit that plagues most of the population. And you will enjoy more energy and optimism. Each day, no matter how busy you get and how many challenges you might face, return to the heart of the rose. It is your island of peace. Never forget that there is power in silence and in stillness. Stillness is the stepping stone to connecting with the universal source of intelligence that throbs through every living being. Julian continued to reveal what he had learned in Savannah. Another particularly good technique is based on what Yogi Raman called opposition thinking. I learned that under the grand laws of nature, the mind can only hold one thought at any one time. Try it yourself, John. You will see that it's true. I did try it, and it is true. Using this little-known information, anyone can easily create a positive, creative mindset within a short period. The process is straightforward. When an undesirable thought occupies the focal point of your mind, immediately replace it with an uplifting one. This is where the prayer beads around my neck come in, Julian added with rising enthusiasm. Every time I catch myself thinking a negative thought, I take this necklace off and remove another bead. These beads of worry go into a cup I keep in my knapsack. Together, they serve as gentle reminders that I still have a distance to travel on the road to mental mastery and responsibility over the thoughts that fill my mind. 
Hey, that's a great one. This is really practical stuff. I have never heard anything quite like it. Tell me more about this philosophy of opposition thinking. Let's say you've had a tough day in court. The judge disagreed with your interpretation of the law. The litigator on the other side belonged in a cage and your client was more than a little annoyed with your performance. You come home and fall into your favorite chair, full of gloom. Step one is to become aware that you are thinking these uninspiring thoughts. Self-knowledge is the stepping stone to self-mastery. Step two is to appreciate once and for all that just as easily as you allow those gloomy thoughts to enter, you can replace them with cheerful ones. So think of the opposite of gloom. Concentrate on being cheerful and energetic. Feel that you are happy. Perhaps you might even start to smile. Move your body as you do when you are joyful and full of enthusiasm. Sit up straight and breathe deeply and train the power of your mind on positive thoughts. You will notice a remarkable difference in the way you feel within minutes. If you keep up your practice of opposition thinking, applying it to every negative thought that habitually visits your mind, within weeks you will see that they no longer hold any power. Julian continued his explanation. Thoughts are vital, living things, little bundles of energy, if you will. A strong, disciplined mind, which anyone can cultivate through daily practice, can achieve miracles. I never saw thoughts as living things, Julian, I replied, amazed at this discovery. The sages of Savannah firmly believe that one should think only sattvic or pure thoughts. If even one impure thought entered the temple of their minds, they would punish themselves by traveling many miles to an imposing waterfall and standing under the ice-cold water until they could no longer bear the frigid temperature. I thought you told me these sages were wise. Standing under an ice-cold waterfall for thinking one little negative thought strikes me as extreme behavior. Julian was lightning fast in his response. John, I'll be blunt. You truly cannot afford the luxury of even one negative thought. A worrisome thought is like an embryo. It starts off small, but grows and grows. Soon it takes on a life of its own. The sages of Savannah had a wonderful way to ensure that their thoughts were pure and wholesome. This technique was also highly effective in manifesting their desires, however simple, into reality. The method will work for anyone. The technique was known to the sages as the secret of the lake. To apply it, these teachers would rise at 4 a.m., as they felt that the early morning possessed magical qualities from which anyone could benefit. The sages would then travel along a series of steep, narrow mountain paths, which eventually led them to the lower reaches of the region they inhabited. Once there, they would walk along a barely visible trail until they arrived at a clearing. At the edge of the clearing was an aqua blue lake covered by thousands of tiny white lotuses. The water of the lake was strikingly still and calm. It was a truly miraculous sight. The sages told me that this lake had been a friend to their ancestors over the ages. Julian explained that the sages would look into the waters of the still lake and envision their dreams becoming reality. If it was the virtue of discipline they wished to cultivate within their lives, they would picture themselves getting up at dawn performing their rigorous physical regimen without fail and spending days in silence to enhance their willpower. If it was courage they desired, they would picture themselves acting with strength in a moment of crisis and challenge. You see, John, the mind works through pictures. Pictures affect your self-image, and your self-image affects the way you feel, act, and achieve. When you run inspiring, imaginative pictures through the movie screen of your mind, wonderful things start to happen in your life. You must spend some time every day, even if it is just a few minutes, in the practice of creative envisioning. See yourself as you want to be, whether this means serving as a great judge, a great father, or a great citizen of your community. Do I have to find a special lake to apply the secret of the lake? I asked innocently. No, you can practice this method in your own living room, or even at your office if you really want to. Shut the door, hold all calls, and close your eyes. Then take a few deep breaths. You will notice that after two or three minutes you will start to feel relaxed. Next, visualize mental pictures of all you want to be, to have, and to attain in your life. If you want to be the world's best father, envision yourself laughing and playing with your kids, 
responding to their questions with an open heart. Picture yourself acting gracefully and lovingly in a tense situation. Mentally rehearse the way you will govern your actions when a similar scene unfolds on the canvas of reality. The magic of visualization can be applied to so many situations. Consistent use of this method will also bring you financial rewards along with an abundance of material gain, if this is important to you. Understand once and for all that your mind has magnetic power to attract all that you desire into your life. Once you start to experience the joy this ancient technique brings, you will realize the infinite potential of your mind and begin to liberate the storehouse of ability and energy that currently sleeps within you. It was as if Julian was speaking a foreign tongue. I had never heard anyone speak of the power of imaging and its profound effects on every aspect of one's world. Yet, deep inside, I had faith in what Julian was saying. But doing these exercises at the office, Julian, my partners think I'm strange enough as it is. Do not be concerned with the judgment of others as long as you know what you are doing is right. You can do whatever you want to do as long as it is correct according to your conscience and your heart. Never be ashamed of doing that to live in the present. You will always have boundless energy, no matter what time the clock reflects. Kindling the Inner Fire John, I'd like to continue to share the elements of Yogi Roman's fable with you, but I must confirm something. We are living in a very troubled world. Negativity pervades it, and many in our society are like floating ships without rudders, weary souls searching for a lighthouse that will keep them from crashing against the rocky shores. You must serve as a captain of sorts. I'm placing my trust in you to take the message of the sages of Savannah to all those who need to hear it. After consideration, I promised Julian with conviction that I would accept this assignment. He then continued passionately. The beauty of the whole exercise is that as you strive to improve the lives of others, which is right, decide on what you think is good and then stick to it. It was now seven minutes past midnight. Remarkably, I didn't feel the least bit tired. When I shared this with Julian, he smiled once again. You have learned yet another principle for enlightened living. When you consistently direct your mind to others, your own life will be elevated into its highest dimensions. This truth is based on an ancient paradigm for extraordinary living. I'm all ears. Basically, the sages of the Himalayas guided their lives by a simple rule. He who serves the most, reaps the most, emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. This is the way to inner peace and outer fulfillment. I once read that people who study others are wise, but those who study themselves are enlightened. Here, perhaps for the first time, I saw a man who truly knew himself, perhaps his highest self. This brings me to the lighthouse, said Julian, remaining focused on the task at hand. I was wondering how that fit into Yogi Raman's fable. You will recall that in the middle of the garden stood a magnificent lighthouse. This symbol will remind you of yet another ancient principle for enlightened living. The purpose of life is a life of purpose. Those who are truly enlightened know what they want out of life, emotionally, materially, physically, and spiritually. Clearly defined priorities and goals for every aspect of your life will serve a role similar to that played by a lighthouse, offering you guidance and refuge when the seas become rough. Julian transported me back to the time when Yogi Raman examined this principle with him. He recalled the sage's exact words. Life is funny, observed Yogi Raman. One would think that the less one worked, the more one would have the chance to experience happiness. However, the real source of happiness can be stated in a word, achievement. Lasting happiness comes from steadily working to accomplish your goals and advancing confidently in the direction of your life's purpose. Workaholic monks? Quite the opposite. While the sages were tremendously productive people, their productivity was not of the frenetic type. Instead, it was of the peaceful, focused, zen-like kind. The sages of Savannah did not waste time. Their collective conscience told them that their lives had a purpose and they had a duty to fulfill. This is what Yogi Raman said to me. Achievement need not be of the material sort. Personally, 
My objectives are to attain peace of mind, self-mastery, and enlightenment. If I fail to accomplish these goals by the end of my life, I am certain that I will die feeling unfulfilled and dissatisfied. Julian told me that this was the first time he had heard any of his teachers in Savannah speak of their own mortality. And Yogi Raman sensed this in my expression. You need not worry, my friend, he said. I have already lived past the age of 100 and have no plans for a quick exit. My point is simply that when you clearly know what aims you wish to achieve over the course of your life, be they material, emotional, physical, or even spiritual, and you spend your days accomplishing them, you will ultimately find eternal joy. Your life will be as delightful as mine, and you will come to know a splendid reality. But you must know your life's aim, and then manifest this vision into reality by consistent action. We sages call this Dharma, which is the Sanskrit word for life's purpose. Lifelong contentment will come from the fulfillment of my Dharma, I asked. Most certainly. Dharma is based upon the ancient principle that says each one of us has a heroic mission while we walk this earth. We have all been granted a unique set of gifts and talents that will readily allow us to realize this life work. The key is to discover them, and in doing so, discover the main objective of your life. Over the course of the next few hours, I learned from Julian that all highly developed, fully actualized people understand the importance of exploring their talents, uncovering their personal purpose, and then applying their human gifts in the direction of this calling. The key is to have the discipline and vision to see your heroic mission and to ensure that it serves other people while you realize it. Is this a form of goal setting? Goal setting is the starting point, said Julian. Mapping out your objectives and your goals releases the creative juices which get you on the path of your purpose. Believe it or not, Yogi Raman and the other sages were very hot on goals. You're kidding. Highly effective monks who meditate all night and set goals all day? I love it! Yogi Raman said, People spend their whole lives dreaming of becoming happier, living with more vitality, and having an abundance of passion. Yet they do not see the importance of taking even 10 minutes a month to write out their goals and to think deeply about the meaning of their lives, their dharma. Goal setting will make your life magnificent. Your world will become richer, more delightful, and more magical. You see, Julian, our ancestors have taught us that setting clearly defined objectives for what we desire in our mental, physical, and spiritual world is critical to the realization. Anyone who wishes to improve the quality of their inner as well as their outer worlds would do well to take out a piece of paper and start writing out their life aims. At the very moment this is done, natural forces will come into play which start to transform these dreams into reality. What I was hearing fascinated me. When I was a football player in high school, my coach had constantly spoken of the importance of knowing what we wanted from every game. Our team wouldn't dream of stepping onto the playing field without a clear game plan that would lead us to victory. I wondered why, as I had grown older, I had never taken the time to develop a game plan for my own life. Maybe Julian and Yogi Raman had something here. What is so special about writing out your goals? How could such a simple act make such a difference? I asked. Julian was delighted. By writing out your desires and goals on a piece of paper, you send a red flag to your subconscious mind that these thoughts are far more important than any others. You change your life the moment you set your goals and start to seek out your dharma, Julian said, his eyes sparkling with the truth of his words. Have you ever met someone with a strange name and then started to notice that name appearing in newspapers, on television, or at the office? This is but one illustration of the ageless principle Yogi Raman called Joe which I have since learned means concentrated mind. Concentrate every ounce of your mental energy on self-discovery. Learn what you excel at and what makes you happy. Whatever it is, find your passion and then follow it. Now that I really think about it, it would be sad to reach the end of my life without realizing that I had some special genius that would have unlocked my potential and helped others, even in a small way. That's right. So from this moment onwards, be acutely aware of your aim in life. Awaken your mind to the abundance of possibility around you. Start to live with more zest. The human mind is the world's largest filtering device. 
when you decide to start concentrating your mind on your life's main aims, your mind starts to filter out the unimportant and focus only on the important. To tell you the truth, I think it's about time I discovered my purpose, I said. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of great things in my life, but it isn't as rewarding as I think it could be. How does that make you feel? Depressed, I offered with total honesty. I know I have talent. Actually, I was one heck of a good artist when I was younger. When I painted, I was in heaven. I lost track of time when I was in the studio painting. I would get lost in the canvas. It was almost as if I transcended time and moved into another dimension. John, this is the power of concentrating mental picture of the outcome. If this was to lose weight, every morning, just after I woke up, I was to envision myself as a lean, fit person, full of vitality and boundless energy. Step two was to get some positive pressure on myself. Pressure can inspire you to achieve great ends. People generally achieve magnificent things when they are forced to tap into the wellspring of human potential that lies within them. How can I create this positive pressure on myself, I asked, now thinking about the possibilities of applying this method to everything from getting up earlier to being a more patient and loving father. One of the best is the public pledge. Tell everyone you know you will lose the excess weight or whatever your goal might be. Once you make your goal known to the world, there will instantly be pressure on you to work towards your mind on a pursuit that you love. Maybe your dharma is to brighten the world with lovely scenes. At least start spending a little time painting every day. How about applying this philosophy to things less esoteric than changing my life? Let's say one of my aims was to drop the spare tire I am carrying around my waist. Where would I start? Julian told me that the sages of Savannah had created a five-step method to reach their objectives and fulfill the purposes of their lives. The first step was to form a clear fulfillment since no one likes to look like a failure. When you train your mind to associate pleasure with good habits and punishment with bad ones, your weaknesses will quickly fall by the wayside. You said there were five steps to follow to make my desires come true, I said impatiently. What are the remaining three? Yes, John. The third step is a simple one. Never set a goal without attaching a timeline to it. To breathe life into a goal, you must have a precise deadline. Remember that a goal that is not committed to paper is no goal at all. Go out and buy a journal. A cheap coil notepad will do. Call this your dream book and fill it with all your desires, objectives, and dreams. Get to know yourself and what you are all about. Don't I already know myself? Most people don't. The Chinese define image in these terms. There are three mirrors that form a person's reflection. The first is how you see yourself. The second is how others see you. And the third mirror reflects the truth. Know yourself, John. Know the truth. Divide your dream book into separate sections for goals relating to the different areas of your life. For example, you might have sections for your physical fitness goals, your financial goals, your personal empowerment goals, your relationship and social goals, and perhaps most importantly, your spiritual goals. Hey, that sounds like fun. I've never thought about doing something as creative as that for myself, I said. Another particularly effective technique is to fill your dream book with pictures of the things you desire and images of people who have cultivated the abilities, talents, and qualities that you hope to emulate. If you want to lose weight and be in outstanding physical shape, paste a picture of a marathon runner or an elite athlete in your dream book. If you want to be the world's finest husband, clip out a picture of someone who represents this, perhaps your father, and put it in your journal in the relationship section. Then review this book daily, even for a few minutes. Make it your friend. The results will startle you. My wife would love to have a dream book. She'd probably fill it with pictures of me without my notorious belly. It's really not that big, Julian suggested in a consoling tone. Then why does Jenny call me Mr. Donut, I said, breaking into a broad smile. Julian started to laugh. I had to follow. Soon the two of us were howling on the floor. I guess if you can't laugh at yourself, who can you laugh at? I said, still giggling. Very true, my friend. 
When I was chained to my former lifestyle, one of the main problems was that I took life far too seriously. Now I am much more playful and childlike. I enjoy all of life's gifts, no matter how small they are. But I have digressed. Once you have formed a clear mental picture of your outcome, created a little pressure behind it, set a deadline and committed it to paper, the next step is to apply what Yogi Raman called the magic rule of 21. The learned men and women of his world believed that for a new behavior to crystallize into a habit, one had to perform the new activity for 21 days in a row. What's so special about 21 days? The only way to permanently install a new habit is to direct so much energy towards it that the old one slips away like an unwelcome house guest. The installation is generally complete in about 21 days, the time it takes to create a new neural pathway. Say I wanted to start practicing the heart of the rose technique to erase the worry habit and live at a more peaceful pace. Do I have to do it at the same time every day? Good question. The only reason to do something is because you want to and because you know it is the right thing for you to do. My suggestion is that you try the heart of the rose method at the same time every day and in the same place every day. There is tremendous power in a ritual. When you insert any activity into your routine by doing it the same way at the same time every day, it quickly grows into a habit. Soon you will be performing the new habit with the same ease that you feel while brushing your teeth. And the final step for attaining goals and advancing along the path of purpose, I wondered? The final step in the sage's method is one that is equally applicable as you advance along the path of your life. The sages of Savannah truly believed that a day without laughter or a day without love was a day without life. Never forget the importance of living with unbridled exhilaration. Never neglect to see the exquisite beauty in all living things. Remain spirited joyful and curious. Stay focused on your life work and on giving selfless service to others. The universe will take care of everything else. This is one of nature's truest laws. Is that it? I still have much wisdom to share with you. Are you tired? Not in the least. Actually, I feel pretty pumped up. You're quite the motivator, Julian. Have you ever thought about an infomercial? I asked mischievously. I don't understand, he replied gently. Never mind, just one of my feeble attempts at humor. Okay, before we move along with Yogi Raman's fable, there was one last point about reaching goals and your dreams that I would like to impress on you. Go for it. There is one word which the sages spoke of in almost reverential terms. This simple word seemed to carry a depth of meaning for them, and it peppered their daily talk. The word I am speaking of is passion and it is a word you must constantly keep at the forefront of your mind. A burning sense of passion is the most potent fuel for your dreams. Here, in our society, we have lost our passion. We do not do things because we love to do them. We do things because we feel we have to do them. This is a formula for misery. Reclaim the joy of waking up every morning full of energy and exhilaration. Breathe the fire of passion into all that you do you will quickly reap great material as well as spiritual rewards. You make it sound so easy. It is. From tonight onwards, take complete control of your life. Decide once and for all to be the master of your fate. Discover your calling and you will start to experience the ecstasy of an inspired life. Finally, always remember that what lies behind you and what lies in front of you is nothing when compared to what lies within you. Thanks, Julian. I really needed to hear this. I never realized all that was lacking in my life until tonight. Things are going to change. I promise you. I am grateful for this. You're welcome, my friend. I'm simply fulfilling my purpose. The Ancient Art of Self-Leadership 
Time is passing quickly, said Julian, before pouring himself another cup of tea. The morning will soon be upon us. Do you want me to continue, or have you had enough for one night? Please continue, Julian. I have all the time in the world. The kids are sleeping at the Japanese sumo wrestler. Sounds like a bad Godzilla movie. I used to love those when I was a kid, Julian said. Me too, but don't let me distract you. The sumo wrestler represents a very important element in the life-changing system of the sages of Savannah. Yogi Raman told me that many centuries ago in the East, the great teachers developed and refined a philosophy called Kaizen. This Japanese word means constant and never-ending improvement, and it's the personal trademark of every man and woman who is living a soaring, fully awakened existence. How did the concept of Kaizen enrich the lives of the sages? I asked. If you really want to improve your outer relationships or your finances, you must first improve your inner world. The most effective way to do this is through the practice of continuous self-improvement. Julian, I hope you don't mind me saying it, but all this talk about one's inner world sounds more than a little esoteric to me. I'm having a little difficulty with this notion of kaizen and improving my inner world. What exactly are we talking about here? Julian was agile in his response. When I speak of improving your inner world, I am simply speaking of self-improvement and personal expansion, and it is the best thing you can do for yourself. Their grandparents' house tonight, and Jenny won't be up for hours. Sensing my sincerity, he continued with the symbolic fable that Yogi Raman had offered him to illustrate his wisdom. You will recall that as the fable continues, the door of the lighthouse slowly opens, and out walks a nine-foot-tall, 900-pound, Taking the time to master your mind, to care for your body, and to nourish your soul will put you in the position to develop more richness and vitality in your life. It is as Epictetus said so many years ago, no man is free who is not a master of himself. I nodded in full agreement. This was the first time I had given any serious thought to the importance of improving myself. I really could use the added energy and good health that exercising would surely bring. Ridding myself of my nasty temper and my habit of interrupting others might do wonders for my relationship with my wife and kids, and erasing my worry habit would give me the peace of mind and deep happiness I had been searching for. The more I thought about it, the more potential improvements I saw. Julian spoke of the importance of building strength of character, developing mental toughness, and living with courage. He told me that these three attributes would lead not only to a virtuous life, but a life filled with achievement, satisfaction, and inner peace. Courage was a quality everyone could cultivate, and one that would pay huge dividends over the long run. What does courage have to do with self-leadership and personal development, I wondered aloud. Courage allows you to do whatever you want to do, because you know it is right. Ultimately, the degree of courage you live with determines the amount of fulfillment you receive. And those who master themselves have an abundance of courage. Okay, I'm starting to understand the power of working on myself. Where do I start? Julian returned to his conversation with Yogi Raman, high atop the mountains, on what he remembered as a remarkably starry and gloriously beautiful night. The more I listened to Yogi Raman, and the more I reflected on the pain and suffering of my former world, the more I welcomed the philosophy of Kaizen, constant and never-ending enrichment of the mind, body, and soul into my new life, Julian asserted. Why am I hearing so much about the mind, body, and soul these days? It seems I can't even turn on the tube without someone making mention of it. This is the trilogy of our human endowments. To improve our mind without the cultivation of your physical gifts would be a very hollow victory. Elevating your mind and body to their highest level without nurturing your soul would leave you feeling very empty and unfulfilled. But when you dedicate your energies to unlocking the full potential of all three of your human endowments, you will taste the divine ecstasy of an enlightened life. You've got me pretty excited, pal. And as to your question about where to start, I promise that I will give you a number of ancient yet powerful techniques in a few moments. But first, I must share a practical illustration with you. Get into push-up position. Good grief, Julian's become a drill sergeant, I silently thought. Being curious and wishing to keep my cup empty, I complied. Now do as many push-ups as you can possibly do. 
don't stop until you truly are certain that you cannot do any more. I struggled with the exercise. The first 15 push-ups were pure agony. At 23 push-ups, I gave up. No more, Julian. This is killing me. The only lesson I'm going to learn from this is what to do for a heart attack. Do 10 more. Then you can rest, commanded Julian. You've got to be kidding. But I continued. One, two, five, eight, and finally ten. I lay on the floor in total exhaustion. What could anyone possibly learn from an experience like this? I asked breathlessly. You told me after you had done 23 that you couldn't do any more. You told me that this was your absolute limit. Yet, when I challenged you to do more, you responded with another 10 push-ups. You had more inside you, and when you reached for your resources, you received more. Yogi Raman explained a fundamental truth to me. The only limits on your life are those that you set yourself. When you push beyond your limits, just as you did in this demonstration, you unlock mental and physical reserves that you never thought you had. Julian sensed he was on a roll. You practice the art of Kaizen by pushing yourself daily. Work hard to improve your mind and your body. Nourish your spirit. Do the things you fear. Be the person you dream of being. Julian continued his passionate discourse. Identify the things that are holding you back. Take the time to reflect on what might be keeping you from the life you really want and know deep down you can have. Once you have identified what your weaknesses are, the next step is to face them head on and attack your fears. This might be the first taste of real freedom that you have experienced in years. Fear is nothing more than a mental monster you have created, a negative stream of consciousness. You mean all my fears are nothing more than imaginary little gremlins that have crept into my mind over the years? Exactly, John. Every time they have prevented you from taking some action, you have added fuel to their fire. But when you conquer your fears, you conquer your life. I need an example. Study a baby. She has no limits. Her mind is a lush landscape of potential and possibility. Properly cultivated, it will lead her to greatness. Filled with negativity, it will lead her to mediocrity at best. A baby could be trained to view a glorious sunny day as depressing. A child could be trained to see a puppy as a vicious animal. An adult could be trained to see a drug as a pleasant vehicle for release. It's all a matter of conditioning, isn't it? Sure. The same holds true for fear. Fear is a conditioned response, a life-sucking habit that can easily consume your energy, creativity, and spirit if you are not careful. When fear rears its ugly head, beat it down quickly. The best way you can do this is to do the thing you fear. When you erase fear from your mind, you start to look younger and your health becomes more vibrant. Ah, the old mind-body connection, I replied, hoping to mask my ignorance. Yes, the sages of the East have known about it for over 5,000 years. Hardly new age, he said with a broad grin. Truly enlightened people are prepared to put off short-term pleasure for the sake of long-term fulfillment. They resolve to live by the wisdom of Kaizen, improving every aspect of themselves ceaselessly and continuously. With time, things that were once difficult become easy. Fears that once prevented them from all the happiness, health, and prosperity they deserved fall to the wayside like stick men toppled by a hurricane. So you're suggesting that I must change myself before I change my life? Yes, it's like that old story my favorite professor told me when I was in law school. One night, a father was relaxing with his newspaper after a long day at the office. His son, who wanted to play, kept on pestering him. Finally, fed up, the father ripped out a picture of the globe that was in the newspaper and tore it into a hundred tiny pieces. Here, son, go and try to put this back together, he said. To his amazement, his son returned after only one minute with the globe perfectly back together. When the startled father asked him how he achieved this feat, the son smiled and gently replied, Dad, on the other side of the globe, there was a picture of a day for 30 consecutive days to practice the strategies. This investment in yourself is all it takes. One hour a day for 30 days is all it takes? It's the magic formula I was always searching for. 
Having said this, you must be disciplined of a person. And once I got the person together, the world was okay. That's a great story. You see, John, the wisest people I have ever met, from the sages of Savannah to my professors at Harvard Law School, all seem to know the key formula for happiness. Exactly how does one go about building courage? It's the same as the story. Once you get yourself together, your world will be okay. But you must spend some time daily working on yourself, even if for only 10 or 15 minutes. And what does the 9 foot tall, 900 pound Japanese sumo wrestler symbolize in Yogi Raman's fable? Our hefty friend will be your constant reminder of the power of Kaizen. In just a few hours, Julian had revealed the most powerful information that I had ever heard in my lifetime. Now I had been exposed to the ageless principle of self-mastery, Kaizen. How can I practice the art of Kaizen? I will give you ten ancient yet supremely effective rituals that will lead you far along the path of personal mastery. If you apply them on a daily basis, with faith in their utility, you will observe remarkable results in just one month from today. Yogi Raman offered the ten rituals to me with great faith in what he termed their exquisiteness. The quid pro quo is that you must set aside at least one and apply the strategies which make up the formula daily with utter conviction in their value. This is not a quick fix type deal. Once you are in, you are in it for the long term. What do you mean? Spending one hour a day tending to yourself will surely give you dramatic results in 30 days, provided you do the right things. The key is that you must keep on practicing them every day if you want to keep on seeing the results. Fair enough, I agreed. Julian clearly had unlocked a wellspring of personal vitality and inner serenity in his own life. Actually, his transformation from a sickly old litigator to a radiant, energetic philosopher was nothing less than miraculous. Maybe I too could undergo a mantle-like transformation. It was surely worth a try. That night, sitting on the floor of my cluttered living room, I learned what Julian called the Ten Rituals of Radiant Living. The first strategy was known to the sages as the Ritual of Solitude. This involves nothing more than ensuring that your daily schedule include a mandatory period of peace. Just what is a period of peace? It is a period of time, as little as 15 minutes or as much as 50, wherein you explore the healing power of silence and come to know who you really are. Its purpose is self-renewal, and this is accomplished by spending time alone, immersed in the beautiful blanket of silence. Solitude and quiet connect you to your creative source and release the limitless intelligence of the universe. You will even sleep better and enjoy a renewed feeling of balance in your day-to-day -day activities. Where should I go for this period of peace? Theoretically, you could do it anywhere, from your bedroom to your office. The key is to find a place of true quiet and beauty. How does beauty fit into the equation? Beautiful images soothe a ruffled soul, Julian observed with a deep sigh. A bouquet of roses or a simple, solitary daffodil will have a highly salutary effect on your senses and relax you to no end. Ideally, you should savor such beauty in a space that will serve as a sanctuary of the self. What's that? Basically, it is a place that will become your secret form for mental and spiritual expansion. This might be a spare room in your house or simply a peaceful corner of a small apartment. The point is to reserve a spot for your renewal activities, a place that sits there quietly awaiting your arrival. I love the sound of that. I think having a silent place to go to when I come home from work would make a world of difference. That brings up another important point. The ritual of solitude works best when you practice it at the same time every day. By practicing it at the same time every day, a daily dose of silence will soon become a habit that you will never neglect. Anything else? Yes, if at all possible, commune with nature daily. A quick walk through the woods or even a few minutes spent cultivating your tomato garden in the backyard will reconnect you to the wellspring of calm that may now be dormant within you. Being with nature also allows you to tune into the infinite wisdom of your highest self. This self-knowledge will move you into the uncharted dimensions of your personal power. Never forget this, Julian advised, his voice rising with passion.
Has this ritual worked well for you, Julian? Absolutely. Some day I spend hours in quiet contemplation. On other days, I spend only 10 minutes. The result is more or less the same. A deep sense of inner harmony and an abundance of physical energy. Which brings me to the second ritual. This is the ritual of physicality. Sounds interesting. What's it all about? The ritual of physicality is based on the principle that says, as you care for the body, so you care for the mind. As you train your body, so you train your mind. Take some time every single day to nourish the temple of your body through vigorous exercise. Get your blood circulating and your body moving. Did you know that there are 168 hours in a week? No, not really. It's true. At least five of those hours should be invested in some form of physical activity. The sages of Savana practiced the ancient discipline of yoga to awaken their physical potential and live a strong, dynamic existence. It was an extraordinary sight to see these marvelous physical specimens who had managed to age-proof their lives standing on their heads in the center of their village. Did the sages do anything else to care for their bodies? Yogi Raman and his brothers and sisters also believed that vigorous walking in natural surroundings worked wonders for relieving fatigue and restoring the body to its natural state of vibrancy. I really think it didn't matter too much to them what they did, so long as they moved their bodies and got the fresh air of their breathtaking surroundings flown through their lungs. What does breathing fresh air have to do with anything? I'll answer your question with one of Yogi Raman's favorite sayings. To breathe properly is to live properly. Quite early on in Savannah, the sages taught me that the fastest way to double or even triple the amount of energy I had was to learn the art of effective breathing. Their philosophy was simple. Take in more oxygen through efficient breathing and you liberate your energy reserves along with your natural state of vitality. Okay, so where do I start? It's actually pretty easy. Two or three times a day, take a minute or two to think about breathing more deeply and effectively. Your belly should move out slightly. This indicates that you are breathing from the abdomen, which is good. A trick that Yogi Raman taught me was to cup my hands over my stomach. If they moved out as I inhaled, my breathing technique was proper. Very interesting. If you like that, then you'll love the third ritual of radiant living, said Julian, which is the ritual of live nourishment. Yogi Raman put it this way, as you nourish your body, so you nourish your mind. I assume then that you changed your diet. Radically, live foods are the answer. Live foods are those which are created through the natural interaction of the sun, air, soil, and water. What I'm talking about here is a vegetarian diet. Fill your plate with fresh vegetables, fruit, and grains, and you might just live forever. Is that possible? Most of the sages were well over 100, and they showed no signs of slowing down. But is this type of diet healthy? This is the diet that nature intended. It is alive, vital, and supremely healthy. The sages have lived by this diet for many thousands of years. If you like meat, you can certainly keep eating it. Just remember that you are ingesting dead food. If you can, cut back on the amount of red meat that you eat. It is really hard to digest, and since your digestive system is one of the body's most energy-consuming processes, valuable energy reserves are needlessly depleted by this foodstuff. Do you see what I'm getting at? Just compare how you feel after eating a steak with your energy levels after you've had a salad. If you don't want to become a strict vegetarian, at least start having a salad with every meal and fruit for dessert. Even this will make a huge difference. Do not read just anything. Make it something that will improve both you and the quality of your life. What did the sages read? They spent many of their waking moments reading and rereading the ancient teachings of their ancestors. They devoured this philosophical literature. It was in Savana that I really learned the power of the book and the principle that a book is the best friend of the wise. To truly get the best out of a great book, you must study it, not just read it. The sages would read many of the books of wisdom in their vast library 10 or 15 times. They treated great books as scriptures, holy documents of divine origin. Wow, is reading really that important? 30 minutes a day will make a delightful difference in your life.
because you will quickly start to see the vast reserves of knowledge available for your use. Read the right books. Learn how those who have preceded you have handled the challenges you are currently facing. What exactly are the right books? Any titles you could recommend to an eager young beaver? I said, flashing a broad grin. Sure. You will thrive on the biography of the great American, Benjamin Franklin. I think you will also find much growth impetus from Mahatma Gandhi's autobiography and title in the quality of your physical life. Try it for about a month and judge the results for yourself. You will feel phenomenal. Okay. If it's good enough for the sages, it's good enough for me. I promise you I will give it a shot. If I have sold you on the ritual of live nourishment, I think you will love the fourth one. The student is still holding his empty cup. The fourth ritual is known as the ritual of abundant knowledge. It centers around the whole notion of lifelong learning and expanding your knowledge base for the good of yourself and all those around you. Read regularly. Reading for 30 minutes a day will do wonders for you. But I must caution you. The story of my experiments with truth. I also suggest that you read Siddhartha by Herman Hesse, the highly practical philosophy of Marcus Aurelius, and some of the work of Seneca. You might even read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I read it last week and I thought it was very profound. Think and Grow Rich, I exclaimed. But I thought you left all that behind you. I'm really sick and tired of all the make money fast manuals that are being peddled out there by snake oil salesmen preying on the weak. Easy, big fella. I couldn't agree with you more, offered Julian, with all the warmth and patience of a wise, loving grandfather. That little book is not about making a lot of money. It's about making a lot of life. Think and Grow Rich is about abundance, including spiritual abundance, and how to attract all that is good into your life. You might do well to read it, but I will not press the point. Sorry, Julian. I guess my temper gets the better of me sometimes, I offered apologetically. One more thing I need to improve. I really am grateful for all that you are sharing with me. No problem. My point is simply read and keep reading. Do you want to know something else interesting? What? Books simply help you to see what is already within yourself. That's what enlightenment is all about. After all my journeying and exploring, I found that I have actually come full circle back to the point from which I started as a young boy. But now I know myself, and all that I am and can be. Okay, what's the fifth ritual of radiant living? It is the ritual of personal reflection. You see, we all have many sleeping talents inside of us. By taking the time to get to know them, we kindle them. However, silent contemplation will deliver even more than this. This practice will make you stronger, more at ease with yourself, and wiser. I'm still a little fuzzy on the concept, Julian. Every night, the sages would retire to the sanctuary of their huts covered by fragrant rose petals and sit in deep contemplation. Yogi Raman would actually take a written inventory of his day. What kinds of things would he write down, I asked. First, he would list all of his activities from the personal care activities of his morning to his interactions with the other sages. Interestingly, he would also write down the thoughts he had run through his mind during that particular day. Isn't that hard to do? I can hardly remember what I thought five minutes ago, let alone 12 hours ago. Take the time to think. Get into the regular habit of personal introspection. Once Yogi Raman had listed all that he had done and all that he had thought in one column, he would then do an assessment in another column. As he was confronted by his activities and thoughts in the written form, he asked himself whether they were positive in nature. If they were, he resolved to continue giving his precious energy to them. And if they were negative, then he would come up with a clear course of action to get rid of them. I think an example might help me. Can it be personal? Julian asked. Sure, I'd love to know some of your innermost thoughts, I suggested. Actually, I was thinking about yours. We both started to giggle like a couple of kids in a schoolyard. Oh, all right. You always did get your own way. Okay, let's go through just a few of the things that you did today. Write them down on that piece of paper on the coffee table, Julian instructed. I started to realize that something important was about to happen. This was the first time in years that I had actually taken the time to do nothing but reflect on the things I was doing and the thoughts I was thinking. 
Where do I start? I asked. Start with what you did this morning and progress through your day. Just hit a few of the highlights. Fine. I woke up at 6.30 to the sound of my electric rooster, I joked. Get serious and keep going, Julian replied firmly. Okay, then I showered and shaved, gobbled down a waffle, and rushed off to work. And what about your family? They were all asleep. Anyway, once I got to the office, I noticed that my 7.30 appointment had been waiting there since 7, and boy was he furious. What was your response? I fought back. What was I supposed to do? Let him push me around? Hmm. Okay. Then what happened? Well, things went from bad to worse. The courthouse called and told me that Judge Wildebeest needed to see me in his chambers, and if I wasn't there within ten minutes, heads would roll. I rushed down to the courthouse and had another argument with one of the clerks. By the time I got back to the office, there were twenty-seven phone messages waiting for me, all marked urgent. Need I go on? Please do. Well, on my way home, Jenny called me in the car and asked me to stop by her mother's house and pick up some of those amazing pies my mother-in-law is famous for. Problem was that when I took that exit, I found myself in the middle of a gridlock. So there I was, in the middle of rush hour traffic, in 95 degree heat, shaking with stress and feeling that even more time was slipping away. How did you respond? I cursed the traffic, I said with complete honesty. I was actually shouting out loud inside my car. Maybe we should stop there. Just take a second and look at your day. Obviously, in retrospect, there are at least a few things that you would do differently if you had the chance, wouldn't you? Well, first, in a perfect world, I would get up earlier. I'd like to have a little peace in the morning and ease myself into the day. The heart of the rose technique sounds like it would be fun. Also, I really would like to have the family around the breakfast table, even if only for a bowl of cereal. It would give me a better sense of balance. I always seem to feel that I never spend enough time with Jenny and the kids. But it is a perfect world, and you have a perfect life. You do have the power to control your day. You do have the power to live your dreams, Julian observed, his voice rising. I am realizing this. I really am starting to feel that I can change. Great. Continue reflecting on your day, he instructed. Well, I wish I hadn't yelled at my client. I wish I hadn't argued with the court clerk, and I wish I hadn't screamed at the traffic. I think you now see the power of the ritual of personal reflection, Julian said. By looking at what you are doing, how you are spending your day, and the thoughts you are thinking, you give yourself a benchmark for measuring improvement. The only way to improve tomorrow is to know what you did wrong today. Lots to think about, Julian. Lots to think about, I offered reflectively. How about thinking about the sixth ritual for radiant living? The ritual of early awakening. Uh-oh, I think I know what's coming. One of the best pieces of advice I learned in that far-off oasis of Savannah was to rise with the sun and to start the day off well. Most of us sleep far more than we need to. The average person can get by on six hours and remain perfectly healthy and alert. Getting up with the sun sounds extreme. Actually, it isn't. There are few things more natural than rising with the glory. Within short order, you will be able to rise at 5.30 a.m. or even 5 a.m. with ease, ready to savor the splendor of another great day. Okay, so let's say that I am getting up every day at 5.30. What do I do? As I've suggested, the thoughts you think and the actions you take in the first 10 minutes after you wake up have a marked effect on the rest of your day. Think positive thoughts. Give a prayer of thanks for all you have. The sages would actually make themselves aware of the first rays of a new day. The sages believed that sunshine was a gift from heaven, and while they were careful not to overexpose themselves, they regularly had sun baths and often could be seen dancing playfully in the early morning sunshine. I firmly believe that this was another key to their extraordinary longevity. Hmm, how do I build this ritual into my routine? Here are a couple of quick tips. First, Never forget that it is the quality and not the quantity of sleep that is important. It is better to have six hours of uninterrupted deep sleep than even ten hours of disturbed sleep. For example, Yogi Raman would never eat after 8 p.m. He said that the digestive activity it induced would reduce the quality of his sleep. Another example was the sage's habit of meditating to the soft sounds of their harp immediately before heading off to sleep. What was the reason behind this? 
The ten minute period before you sleep and the ten minute period after you wake up are profoundly influential on your subconscious mind. By determining the thoughts that go in, you are also determining precisely what will come out. So before you go to sleep, do not watch the news or argue with anyone or even go over the day's events in your mind's eye. Relax. Drink a cup of herbal tea if you like. Listen to some soft classical music and prepare yourself to drift into a rich, renewing slumber. It makes sense. The better the sleep, the less I will need. Exactly. And remember the ancient rule of 21. If you do anything for 21 days in a row, it will be installed as a habit. So stay with the early rising routine for about three weeks. By then it will be a part of your life. Laugh whether they felt like it or not, just to get the happiness juices flowing early in the morning. Julian, I am trying very hard to keep my cup empty. And I think you will agree that I've done pretty well for a novice. But that sounds really odd, even for a band of monks living high in the Himalayas. But it's not. Take a guess how many times the average four-year-old laughs in a day. Who knows? I do. Three hundred. Now guess how many times the average adult in our society laughs in the course of a day. Fifty, I tried. Try fifteen, said Julian, smiling in satisfaction. You see my point? Laughter is medicine for the soul. Even if you don't feel like it, look in the mirror and laugh for a couple of minutes. You can't help but feel fantastic. Every day will then be an exquisitely rewarding one. What do you do to start your day off on a positive footing? Actually, I have developed quite a sophisticated morning routine which includes everything from the heart of the rose to drinking a couple of glasses of freshly squeezed fruit juice. But there is one strategy in particular which I would like to share with you. Sounds important. It is. Shortly after you have awakened, go into your sanctuary of silence. Get still and focused. Then ask yourself this question. What would I do today if this day was my last? Mentally list all the things you would do, the people you would call, and the moments you would savor. When you live every day as if it was your last, your life will take on a magical quality. And this brings me to the seventh of the rituals of radiant living, the ritual of music. Never forget the power of music. Spend a little time with it every day, even if it is listening to a soft piece on a cassette while you drive to work. When you feel down or weary, play some music. It is one of the finest motivators I know of. Aside from yourself, I exclaimed sincerely. Just listening to you makes me feel great. You really have changed, Julian, and not just on the outside. You really do seem to be at peace with yourself. You have touched me tonight. Hey, there's more, shouted Julian with his fist in the air. Let's keep going. I wouldn't have it any other way. Okay. The eighth ritual is the ritual of the spoken word. The sages had a series of mantras which they would recite morning, noon, and night. They told me that this practice was immensely effective in keeping them focused, strong, and happy. What's a mantra? I asked. A mantra is nothing more than a collection of words strung together to create a positive effect. In Sanskrit, man means mind and tra means freeing. So a mantra is a phrase which is designed to free the mind. And believe me, John, mantras accomplish this objective in a very powerful way. So mantras are spoken? They don't have to be. Written affirmations also are very effective. But I have found that repeating a mantra aloud has a wonderful effect on my spirit. When I need to feel motivated, I might repeat, I am inspired, disciplined, and energized out loud two or three hundred times. To maintain the supreme sense of self-confidence I have cultivated, I might repeat, I am strong, able, and calm. I even use mantras to keep me youthful and vital, Julian admitted. Which leads us to the ninth ritual of radiant living quite nicely. This is the ritual of congruent character. This ritual requires you to take daily, incremental action to build your character. Perhaps Yogi Raman articulated the formula best when he stated, You sow a thought, you reap an action. Reap an action, you sow a habit. Sow a habit, you reap a character. Sow a character, you reap your destiny. What kinds of things should I do to build my character? anything that cultivates your virtues. Before you ask me what I mean by virtues, let me clarify the concept. 
The wise people of the Himalayas believed strongly that a virtuous life was a meaningful life, so they governed all their actions by a series of timeless principles. But I thought you said they governed their lives by their purpose. Yes, this is quite so, but their life's calling included living in a manner congruent to these principles. They are, simply stated, industry, compassion, humility, patience, honesty, and courage. When all your actions are congruent and aligned with these principles, you will feel a deep sense of inner harmony and peace. This is also when your life will move from the ordinary into the realm of the extraordinary, and you will begin to sense the sacredness of your being. It is the first step to lifelong enlightenment. Have you tasted this experience? I asked. I have, and I believe you will too. Do the right things. Act in a way that is congruent with your true character. Act with integrity. Be guided by your heart. The rest will take care of itself. You are never alone, you know. And the final ritual? This is the all-important ritual of simplicity. This ritual requires you to live a simple life. As Yogi Raman said, one must never live in the thick of thin things. Focus only on your priorities, those activities which are truly meaningful. Your life will be uncluttered, rewarding, and exceptionally peaceful. This I promise you. But earlier you told me that happiness comes from achievement. Now you are telling me to reduce my needs and be content with less. Isn't that a paradox? Excellent point, John. It might seem like a contradiction, but it isn't. Lifelong happiness does come through striving to realize your dreams. The key is not to make your happiness contingent on finding that elusive pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. For example, even though I was a millionaire many times over, I was so money-driven that I couldn't enjoy all that I had. You know, there came a time when all I could eat was bread and water, Julian said, growing very quiet and pensive. Are you serious? I always thought that you ate at the best restaurants with all those celebrity friends of yours. That was in the early days. Not many people know about this, but the burden of my out-of-control lifestyle gave me a bleeding ulcer. Julian caught himself. But I'm not one to live in the past. It was another one of life's great lessons. To transcend pain, I had to first experience it. I wouldn't be where I am today without it, he said stoically. Any ideas on what I should do to bring the ritual of simplicity into my life, I asked? There are so many things you can do. Stop picking up the phone every time it rings. Stop wasting time reading junk mail. Stop eating out three times a week. Give up your golf club membership and spend more time with your kids. Spend a day a week without your watch. Watch the sun rise every few days. Sell your cellular phone and dump your pager to make your life work. Try the techniques and use those that feel right to you. After Julian had explained the ten rituals for radiant living, he paused. I know that you want me to keep on going, so I will. Perhaps this is a good time to get a little deeper. What I have taught you up to now has been immensely practical, but you must know something of the underlying spiritual current which flows through the principles I have outlined. Okay, let's hear the spiritual stuff, I said energetically, unaware that it was nearly 2.30 in the morning. Within you lies the sun, the moon, the sky, and all the wonders of this universe. The intelligence that created these wonders is the same force that created you. All things around you come from the same source. We are all one. I'm not sure I follow you. Every being on this earth, every object on this earth has a soul. All souls flow into one. This is the soul of the universe. You see, John, when you nourish your own mind and your own spirit, you are really feeding the soul of the universe. When you improve yourself, you are improving the lives of all those around you. And when you have the courage to advance confidently in the direction of your dreams, you begin to draw upon the power of the universe. Julian, I know you mean well, but what happens if I fail? Failure is not having the courage to try. Nothing more and nothing less. The only thing standing between most people and their dreams is the fear of failure. Yet failure is essential to success in any endeavor. Never fear failure. Failure is your friend. The Power of Discipline Julian continued to use Yogi Raman's mystical fable as the cornerstone for the wisdom he was sharing with me. You will recall that our friend the sumo wrestler 
was stark naked. Except for the pink wire cable covering his private parts, I interjected gamely. Right. Need I continue? Julian asked rhetorically. I get the point. But sell the cell phone? I asked anxiously, feeling as a baby might at the doctor's suggestion that his umbilical cord should be cut. Like I've said, my duty is to share the wisdom I've learned through my journey with you. You need not apply every strategy, applauded Julian. The pink wire cable will serve to remind you of the power of self-control and discipline in building a richer, happier, and more enlightened life. My teachers in Savannah taught me that the virtue of discipline was like a wire cable. Have you ever really taken the time to study a wire cable, John? It hasn't been high on my priority list, I confessed with a quick grin. Well, have a look at one sometime. You will see that it consists of many thin, tiny wires placed one on top of the other. Alone, each one is flimsy and weak, but together their sum is much greater than their constituent parts and the cable becomes tougher than iron. Self-control and willpower are similar to this. To build a will of iron, it is essential to take small, tiny acts in tribute to the virtue of personal discipline. Routinely performed, the little acts pile one on top of another to eventually produce an abundance of inner strength. Self-discipline will provide you with the mental reserves required to persevere when life throws you one of its little curves. I must also alert you to the fact that the lack of willpower is a mental disease, Julian added surprisingly. Willpower allows you to do what you said you would do when you said you would do it. It is willpower that offers you the inner power to keep your commitments to others and perhaps even more importantly, to yourself. Is it really that important? Most certainly, my friend. It is the essential virtue of every person who has created a life rich with passion, possibility, and peace. Julian then reached into his robe and pulled out a shiny silver locket, the kind you might see in a museum exhibit on ancient Egypt. You shouldn't have, I joked. The sages of Savannah gave this gift to me on my last evening with them. It was a joyous, loving celebration between members of a family who had lived life to the fullest. It was one of the greatest and one of the saddest nights of my life. I left part of myself high in the Himalayas that evening, Julian said, his voice growing soft. What are the words engraved on the locket? Here, I'll read them to you. Never forget them, John. They have really helped me when times got tough. Through the steel of discipline, you will forge a character rich with courage and peace. Through the virtue of will, you are destined to rise to life's highest ideal and live within a heavenly mansion filled with all that is good, joyful, and vital. Without them, you are lost like a mariner without a compass, one who eventually sinks with his ship. Julian added, Building self-control and discipline into your life will also bring you a tremendous sense of freedom. This alone will change things. Julian then noted the many practical benefits that the cultivation of discipline would bring. Believe it or not, developing the power of your will can erase the worry habit, keep you healthy, and give you far more energy than you have ever had. You see, John, self-control is really nothing more than mind control. Will is the king of mental powers. When you master your mind, you master your life. Mental mastery starts with being able to control every thought that you think. When you have developed the ability to discard all weak thoughts and focus only on those that are positive and good, positive and good actions will follow. Soon you will start attracting all that is positive and good into your life. Here's an example. Let's say one of your personal development goals is to get up every morning at 6 a.m. and go for a run. Let's pretend it is now the middle of winter and your alarm wakes you from a deep, restful sleep. Your first impulse is to hit the snooze button and return to your slumber. Perhaps you will live up to your exercise resolution tomorrow. This pattern continues for a few days until you decide that you are too old to change your ways and the physical fitness goal was too unrealistic. You know me too well, I offered sincerely. Now let's consider an alternative scenario. It is still the dead of winter. The alarm goes off and you start to think of staying in bed. But instead of being a slave to your habits, you challenge them with more powerful thoughts. You start to picture in your mind's eye how you will look, feel, and act when you are in peak physical shape. You focus on all that you can accomplish with the increased energy a regular exercise program will bring. 
No more nights spent in front of the television because you are too tired to do anything else after your long day in court. Your days are filled with vitality, enthusiasm, and meaning. But say I do this, and I still feel like going back to sleep rather than going running. If you continue to wage war against the weaker thoughts that might have silently crept into the palace of your mind over the years, eventually they will see that they are unwanted and leave like visitors who know that they are not welcome. You mean to tell me that thoughts are physical things? Yes, and they are fully in your control. It is just as easy to think positive thoughts as it is to think negative ones. So if I want to have the inner strength to get up earlier, eat less, read more, worry less, be more patient or be more loving, all I have to do is exert my will to cleanse my thoughts? When you control your thoughts, you control your mind. When you control your mind, you control your life. And once you reach the stage of being in total control of your life, you become the master of your destiny. I needed to hear this. Through the course of this strange yet inspiring evening, I had gone from being a skeptical litigator, carefully studying a hotshot lawyer turned yogi, to a believer whose eyes had been opened for the first time in many years. I wish Jenny could hear all this. Actually, I wish my kids could hear this wisdom too. I knew it would affect them as it had me. I had always planned on being a better family man and living more fully, but I always found that I was too busy putting out all those brush fires of life that seemed so pressing. It seemed like yesterday that I was a young law student full of energy and enthusiasm. I dreamed of becoming a political leader or even a Supreme Court judge back then. But as time went by, I settled into a routine. I think it was at that moment, with Julian sitting next to me on my living room floor on that sticky July night that I changed. The Japanese call it satori, meaning instant awakening, and that's exactly what it was. I resolved to fulfill my dreams and make my life far more than it had ever been. That was my first taste of real freedom, the freedom that comes when you decide once and for all to take charge of your life and all its constituent elements. I will give you a formula for developing willpower, said Julian, who had no idea of the inner disciplined, principled life that will connect you to your dreams. And you need not change your world in a day. Start off small. Even training yourself to get up an hour earlier and sticking to this wonderful habit will boost your self-confidence, inspiring you to reach higher heights. The trick is to keep setting the mark higher and raising your standards continuously. This will release that magical quality of momentum that will motivate you to keep exploring your infinite potential. Momentum is also the secret ingredient to building self-discipline. It's a delightful process, John. It really is. And the pink wire cable in Yogi Raman's magical fable will always remind you of the power of your will. Just as Julian finished revealing his thoughts on the subject of discipline, I noticed the first rays of the sun peeking into the living room pushing away the darkness like a child pushes away an unwanted bed cover. This will be a great day, I thought. The first day of the rest of my life. Your most precious commodity. You know what's funny about life, Julian said? By the time most people figure out what they really want and how to go about attaining it, it's usually too late. Is that what the stopwatch in Yogi Raman's fable is all about? Yes, the naked, nine foot tall, nine transformation I had just experienced. Wisdom without proper tools for its application is no wisdom at all. He continued, every day while you are walking to work, I would like you to repeat a few simple words. Yogi Raman told me that by its repetition, I would develop self-control and an indomitable will within a short period of time. Okay, I'm all ears. This is the mantra I suggest you repeat at least 30 times a day. I am more than I appear to be. All the world's strength and power rest inside me. It will manifest profound changes in your life. For even quicker results, blend this mantra with the practice of creative envisioning I spoke of earlier. Startling results will surely come your way, he promised. That's it? I asked, astonished by the apparent simplicity of this formula. I can tap the full reserves of my willpower through this simple exercise? 
Repeating the mantra I gave you, along with the daily practice of seeing yourself as you hope to be, will give you an enormous amount of support as you create the 100 pound sumo wrestler with the pink wire cable covering his private parts, slips on a shiny gold stopwatch that someone has left in the beautiful garden, Julian reminded me. And exactly what does the shiny gold stopwatch represent? It is a symbol of our most precious commodity, time. What about positive thinking and goal setting and self-mastery? They all mean nothing without time. About six months after I made Savannah my temporary home, one of the sages came to my hut while I was studying. Her name was Divya. She was a stunningly beautiful woman with jet black hair that fell below her waist and in a very gentle and sweet voice. She informed me that she was the youngest of all of the sages. She also said that she had come to me on the instructions of Yogi Raman. As the youngest of our community, I have been asked to bring you a gift. It is from all of us, and we offer it as a token of our respect for you, one who has traveled so far to learn our ways. What was the gift? I asked impatiently. It was a miniature hourglass, which had been made from blown glass and a small piece of sandalwood. Seeing my expression, Divya quickly told me that each of the sages had received one of these instruments as children. Though we have no possessions and live pure, simple lives, we respect time and note its passing. These little hourglasses serve as daily reminders of our mortality and the importance of living full, productive days while advancing our purposes. These monks kept time? Each and every one of them understood the importance of time. They each had developed what I call a time consciousness. Time is the greatest leveler. Whether we are privileged or disadvantaged, whether we live in Texas or Tokyo, we all have been allotted days with only 24 hours. Once I heard my father say it was the busiest people who have time to spare. What do you make of that? Busy, productive people are highly efficient with their time. They must be in order to survive. Being an excellent time manager doesn't mean that you must become a workaholic. On the contrary, time mastery allows you more time to do the things that are truly meaningful to you. Time mastery leads to life mastery. Guard your time well. Remember, it's a non-renewable resource. Let me give you an example Julian offered. Let's say it's Monday morning and your schedule is overflowing with appointments and meetings. Let's say you took 15 minutes the night before to plan your day. Or to be even more effective, let's say you took one hour on your quiet Sunday morning to organize your entire week. In your daily planner, you wrote out when you would meet your clients, when you would do legal research, and when you would return phone calls. Most importantly, your personal, social, and spiritual development goals for the week also went into your agenda book. By anchoring all the most vital aspects of your life into your daily schedule, you ensure that your week and your life retain a sense of meaning and peace. Surely you're not suggesting that I take a break in the middle of my busy workday to walk in the park or meditate. All I'm saying is plan your week and manage your time creatively. Have the discipline to focus your time around your priorities. The most meaningful things in your life should never be sacrificed to those that are the least meaningful. I agree, Julian, but I really don't have the time to take breaks in the middle of my day. As it is, I work most evenings. As I said this, I felt my stomach tingling at the mere thought of the mountain of work I was facing. One of the great rules I learned from that wise old sage is that 80% of the results you achieve in your life come from only 20% of the activities that occupy your time. Yogi Raman called it the ancient rule of 20. I'm not sure I follow you. Okay, let's go back to your busy Monday. From morning until night, you might spend your time doing everything from drafting legal pleadings to reading your youngest child a bedtime story or playing chess with your wife. Agreed? Agreed. But out of all of the hundreds of activities you give your time to, only 20% will yield real, lasting results. Only 20% of what you do will have an influence on the quality of your life. These are your high-impact activities. For example, 10 years from now, do you really think that all the time you spend gossiping at the water cooler or watching television will count for anything? No, not really. Right, so I'm sure you will also agree there are a number of activities that will account for everything. You mean like time spent improving my legal knowledge, time spent enriching my relationships with my clients, and time invested in becoming a more efficient lawyer? 
Yes, and time spent nourishing your relationship with Jenny and the kids. Time spent connecting with nature and showing gratitude for all you are so fortunate to have. Time spent renewing your mind, your body, and your spirit. Direct all of your time to those activities that count. Enlightened people are priority driven. This is the secret of time mastery. Wow, Yogi Raman taught you all that? I have become a student of life, John. Yogi Raman certainly was a wonderful and inspiring teacher, and I will never forget him for that. But all of the lessons I have learned from my varied experiences have now come together like pieces of a big jigsaw puzzle to show me the way to a better life. I had been to many seminars in time management as a lawyer, yet I had never heard the philosophy of time mastery that Julian was now sharing with me. Time management was not just something to focus on at the office and discard at closing time. It was a holistic system that could make all areas of my life more balanced and fulfilling. I would not only be far more productive, I would be far happier. That brings me to another point. Don't let others steal your time. Learn to say no. Having the courage to say no to the little things in life will give you the power to say yes to the big things. What about procrastination? All too often, I keep putting off the things that I don't like doing. It is human nature to do the things that feel good and avoid the things that feel bad. But as I said earlier, the most productive people in this world have cultivated the habit of doing the things that less productive people don't like doing, even though they too might not like doing them. I stopped and thought deeply about the principle I had just heard. Perhaps procrastination was not my problem. Maybe my life had simply become too complex. Julian sensed my concern. Yogi Raman told me that those who are masters of their fear opens your heart and soothes your soul. No one should ever take life so seriously that they forget to laugh at themselves. Julian had one final thought to share on the subject of time. Perhaps most importantly, John, stop acting like you have 500 years to live. Develop a deathbed mentality. When you adopt a deathbed mentality, you live every day as if it was your last. The deathbed question alone has the power to change your life. It will energize your days and bring a rush of zest and spirit to all that you do. Powerful stuff. Here's more. There is a simple remedy to break the spell of frustration that plagues so many people. Act as if failure is impossible and your success will be assured. Be brave and set no limits on the workings of your imagination. Never be a prisoner of your past. Become time, live simple lives. A hurried, frenzied pace is not what nature intended. While he firmly believed that lasting happiness could be reached only by those who were effective and set definite aims for themselves, living a life rich with accomplishment and contribution did not have to come through sacrifice of peace of mind. This is what I found so fascinating about the wisdom I was hearing. It allowed me to be more productive and yet fulfill my spiritual longings. I started to open up myself even more to Julian. You have always been honest and forthright with me, so I will be the same with you. I don't want to give up my practice and my house and my car to be happier and more satisfied. I like my toys and the material things I have earned. They are my rewards for all the hours I have worked over the years. But I feel empty. I really do. There is so much I could do with my life. You know, I'm almost 40 and I have never been to the Grand Canyon or the Eiffel Tower. I can't even remember the last time I took a long, quiet walk by myself after a snowfall just to hear the sounds and to enjoy the sensations. Then simplify your life, Julian suggested sympathetically. Apply the ancient ritual of simplicity to every aspect of your world. Too many people are dreaming of some magical rose garden on the horizon rather than enjoying the one growing in their backyards. What a tragedy. Any suggestions? That I will leave to your own imagination. Oh, and that reminds me of another thing I do to make sure my life stays calm and simple. What's that? I love to have a quick nap in the afternoon. I find it keeps me energetic, refreshed, and youthful. I guess you could say that I need my beauty sleep, Julian laughed. Beauty has never been one of your strong points. A sense of humor has always been one of yours, and for this I commend you. I think Yogi Raman said it best when he said, Laughter, the architect of your future. You will never be the same. As the city started to awaken and the morning grew into full bloom, my ageless friend started to show the first signs of weariness 
after a night spent sharing his wisdom with an eager student. I had been astonished by Julian's stamina, his boundless energy, and his endless enthusiasm. We are moving to the end of Yogi Raman's magical fable and approaching the time when I must leave you, he said gently. Are you going to tell your partners that you have returned home, I asked, my curiosity getting the better of me? Probably not, Julian replied. I'm so different from the Julian mantle they knew. They wouldn't recognize me. You really are a new man, I agreed, chuckling inwardly as I pictured this mystical monk adorned in the traditional robes of Savannah, stepping into the striking red Ferrari of his former life. A new being is probably even more accurate. I don't see the distinction, I confessed. There is an ancient saying in India, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. I see what I am. I am no longer in the world. The world is in me. I'm going to have to chew on that one for a while, I said in total honesty, not quite comprehending what Julian was talking about. Sure, I understand, my friend. A time will come when you are clear on what I am saying. If you follow the principles I have revealed to you and apply the techniques I have offered, you will surely advance along the path of enlightenment. You will see your life for what it really is, a small blip on the canvas of eternity, and you will come to see clearly who you are and the ultimate purpose of your life, which is to serve, of course. Listen to your conscience. It will tell you that your calling in life is ultimately selfless service to others in some form or another. My mission is to spread the ancient wisdom of the sages of Savannah to all those who need to hear it. This is my purpose. The fire of knowledge had kindled Julian's spirit. He was so passionate, so committed, and so fervent about what he was saying that it was reflected even in his physical dimension. His transformation from a frail old litigator to a vital young Adonis was not brought about by a simple change in his diet or a daily dose of some quick-fix exercise plan. He had found the secret that people through the ages have been searching for. It was more than the secret of youth, fulfillment, or even happiness. Julian had discovered the secret of the self. The Ultimate Purpose of Life The sages of Savannah were not only the most youthful people I have ever met, observed Julian. They were also the kindest. Yogi Raman told me that when he was a child, as he waited for sleep, his father would ask him what good deeds he had performed through the course of that day. Believe it or not, if he said that he hadn't done any, his father would request that he get up and perform some act of kindness and selfless service before he was permitted to go to sleep. Julian went on. One of the most essential of all the virtues for enlightened living that I can share with you, John, is this one. When all is said and done, no matter what you have achieved, the quality of your life will come down to the quality of your contribution. Does this have something to do with the fresh yellow roses in Yogi Raman's fable? Of course it does. The flowers will remind you of the ancient Chinese proverb, a little bit of fragrance always clings to the hand that gives you roses. The meaning is clear. When you work to improve the lives of others, you indirectly elevate your own life in the process. When you take care to practice random acts of kindness daily, your own life becomes far richer and more meaningful. To cultivate the sacredness and sanctity of every day, serve others in some way. Are you suggesting that I get involved in some volunteer work? That's an excellent starting point, but what I'm speaking of is much more philosophical than that. I'm suggesting that you adopt a new paradigm of your role on this planet. You're losing me again. Shed some light on the term paradigm. I'm not really familiar with it. A paradigm is simply a way of looking at a circumstance or at life in general. Some people see the glass of life as half empty. The optimists see it as half full. They interpret the same circumstance differently because they have adopted a different paradigm. A paradigm is basically the lens through which you see the events of your life, both external and internal. To dramatically improve the quality of your life, you must cultivate a new perspective of why you are here on earth. You must realize that there can only be one real reason for your being here. And that would be to give yourself to others and to contribute in a meaningful way, Julian replied. Our world is in the midst of great change. People are trading in money for meaning. 
Lawyers who used to judge people by the size of their pocketbooks are now judging people by the size of their commitment to others, by the size of their hearts. Teachers are leaving the wombs of secure jobs to nurture the intellectual growth of needy kids living in the combat zones we call inner cities. People have heard the clear call for change. People are realizing that they are here for a purpose and that they have been given special gifts that will aid them to realize it. What kind of special gifts? Exactly the ones I've been telling you about all evening. An abundance of mental ability, boundless energy, unlimited creativity, and a storehouse of discipline and a wellspring of peacefulness. It is simply a matter of unlocking these treasures and applying them for common good, noted Julian. So how can one go about doing good? I'm simply saying that you should make it a priority to change your worldview so that you stop seeing yourself purely as an individual and start seeing yourself as part of the collective. Your life moves to a more magical dimension when you start striving to make the world a better place. I knew Julian had a point. One of the things that was starting to bother me about practicing law was that I didn't really feel I was making the sort of contribution I knew I was capable of making. I realized that I had ensconced myself in a middle-class cocoon, one that I'll have to leave soon. You have commitments which are pressing on your time, and I have my own work to tend to, Julian said apologetically. My work can wait. Unfortunately, mine can't, he said with a quick smile. But before I leave, I must reveal the fine that sheltered me from society at large and one I had grown accustomed to. Compassion and daily acts of kindness will make life far richer, Julian said. Take the time to meditate every morning on the good you will do for others during your day. The sincere words of praise to those who least expect it. The gestures of warmth offered to friends in need. The small tokens of affection to members of your family. All add up to a much more wonderful way to live. And speaking of friendships, make sure you keep them in constant repair. A person with three solid friends is very wealthy indeed. I nodded. Friends add humor, fascination, and beauty to life. Good friends are there to help you when life throws one of its little curves at you and things look worse than they seem. When I was a busy litigator, I had no time for friends. Now I am alone, except for you, John. When I have just put down a wonderful book that has moved me deeply, I have no one to share my thoughts with. I have no one to open my soul to when the sunshine of a glorious autumn day warms my heart and fills me with joy. Julian quickly caught himself. However, regret is not an activity for which I have any time. I have learned from my teachers in Savannah that every dawn is a new day to the one who is enlightened. Julian's eyes glittered in the hope of things yet to come. It appeared to me that Julian Mantle had indeed been elevated from a human being passing through life without a care for anyone to a spiritual being passing through life only caring about others. Perhaps this was the path that I too was about to walk. Timeless Secret of Lifelong Happiness It had been over 12 hours since Julian had arrived at my house. Those 12 hours were, without a doubt, the most important of my life. All at once, I was feeling exhilarated, motivated, and yes, even liberated. I realized that I had not even begun to explore the reaches of my human potential. Julian's wisdom allowed me the opportunity to come to grips with the wounds that were keeping me from living with the laughter, energy, and fulfillment I knew that I deserved. I felt moved. The element of Yogi Raman's magical fable. You will recall that the sumo wrestler fell to the ground. After what seemed like an eternity, he finally regained consciousness when the marvelous fragrance of the yellow roses reached his nose. He then jumped to his feet in delight and was astonished to see a long, winding path studded with millions of tiny diamonds. Of course, our friend the sumo wrestler took the path and in doing so, lived happily ever after. Seems plausible, I chuckled. Yogi Raman's story has a purpose and the principles it symbolizes are not only powerful 
they are highly practical. True, I agreed without reservation. The path of diamonds, then, will serve to remind you of the final virtue of enlightened living. By carrying this principle with you through your daily work, you will enrich your life. You will begin to see the exquisite wonders in the simplest of things and live with the ecstasy you deserve. And by carrying out your promise to me and sharing it with others, you will also allow them to transform their world from the ordinary into the extraordinary. Will this take me a while to learn? The principle itself is strikingly straightforward to grasp, but learning how to apply it effectively in all your waking moments will take a couple of weeks of steady practice. Okay, I'm dying to hear it. Funny you should say that, because the seventh and final virtue is all about living. The sages of Savannah believed that a truly joyful and rewarding life comes only through a process they called living in the now. The most important moment is now. Learn to live in it and savor it fully. I understand exactly what you're saying, Julian. My mind is always flooded by a million little thoughts pulling me in a million different directions. It's really frustrating. Why? It tires me out. I guess I just don't have peace of mind. Yet I have experienced times when my mind is fully occupied on only what was in front of me. Often, this happened when I was under the gun to crank out a legal brief and I didn't have time to think about anything other than the task at hand. I've also felt this kind of total focus when I was playing soccer with the boys and I really wanted to win. Hours seemed to pass by in minutes and I felt centered. It was as if the only thing that mattered to me was what I was doing in that very moment. Come to think of it, these were probably the times when I felt the most peaceful as well. Julian replied, Being engaged in a pursuit that truly challenges you is the surest route to personal satisfaction. But the real key to remember is that happiness is a journey, not a destination. Live for today. There will never be another one quite like it, finished Julian, his smooth hands coming together as if to give a prayer of thanks for being privy to what he had just said. Is that the principle that the path of diamonds in Yogi Raman's fable symbolizes, I asked? You can have the life you deserve the very moment you start to understand that the path you are currently walking on is one rich with diamonds and other priceless treasures. Enjoy the beauty and the sacredness of all that is around you. You owe it to yourself. Does that mean that I should stop setting big goals for my future and concentrate on the present? No, replied Julian firmly. Goals and dreams for the future are essential elements in every truly successful life. My point is simply this. Never put off happiness for the sake of achievement. Today is the day to seize the moment and live a life that soars. Today is the day to live from your imagination and harvest your dreams. And please never, ever forget the gift of family. I'm not sure I know exactly what you mean, Julian. Live your children's childhood, came the simple reply. Huh? I muttered, perplexed at the apparent paradox. Few things are as meaningful as being a part of your children's childhood. What is the point of climbing the steps of success if you have missed the first steps of your own kids? What is the use of being known across the country as a red-hot trial lawyer if your kids don't even know their father, Julian offered, his voice now quivering with emotion. I know where if I speak. This last comment floored me. What could this former millionaire playboy know about being a father? I do know something of the blessings we call children, he said softly. But I always thought you were the city's most eligible bachelor before you threw in the towel and gave up your practice. Before I was caught up in the illusion of that fast and furious lifestyle, you know that I was married. Yes? He then paused, as a child might before telling his best friend a closely guarded secret. What you do not know is that I also had a little daughter. She was the sweetest, most delicate creature I have ever seen in my life. People told me I had a brilliant future, a stunningly beautiful wife, and a wonderful daughter. Yet when life seemed to be perfect, it was all taken from me in an instant. For the first time since his return, Julian's eternally joyful face was enveloped in sadness. A single tear began to slide down one of his bronzed cheeks and dripped onto the velvety fabric of his ruby-red robe. You don't have to continue, Julian, I offered sympathetically, placing an arm around his shoulder to comfort him. The drunk driver who killed my daughter didn't take away only one precious life 
on that sun-soaked October afternoon. He took two. After my daughter's passing, my life unraveled. I started spending every waking moment at the office, foolishly hoping that my legal career might be the solve for the pain of a broken heart. My wife, who had been my constant companion since law school, left me, setting my obsession with work. My health deteriorated, and I spiraled into the infamous life that I was engaged in when we first met. Sure, I had everything money could possibly buy, but I sold my soul for it. I really did, Julian noted emotionally, his voice still choked up. So when you say, live your children's childhood, you are basically telling me to take the time to watch them grow and her golden hair. She took a piece of my heart with her when she left. And though my life has been inspired by new meaning since I found the way to enlightenment and self-leadership in Savannah, a day doesn't pass without me seeing the rosy face of my sweet little girl in the silent theater of my mind. You have such great kids, John. The best gift you could ever give your children is your love. Get to know them again. Pretty soon they will be off, building lives and families of their own. Then it'll be too late. The time will be gone. Julian had struck a chord deep inside of me. I guess I had known for some time that my workaholic pace was slowly but steadily loosening our family ties. Piano recitals, Christmas plays, Little League championships had all been traded for my professional advancement. Happiness is a journey, Julian continued, his voice rising once again with the heat of passion. Enjoy the special moments that every day offers, because today, this day is all you have. Can anyone learn to live in the now? Absolutely. No matter what your current circumstances might be, you can train yourself to enjoy the gift of living and fill your existence with the jewels of everyday life. When you start spending even five minutes a day practicing the art of gratitude, you will cultivate the richness of living that you are looking for. So by giving daily thanks for all of my assets, whether these are material or spiritual, I will develop the habit of living in the moment? Yes, this is an effective method for putting far more living into your life. When you savor the now, you kindle the fire of life that allows you to grow your destiny. Grow my destiny? We all have something we are meant to do. Your genius will shine through. Happiness will fill your life the instant you discover your higher purpose and then direct all your energies towards it. Once you are connected to this mission, all your desires will be fulfilled effortlessly. Simply follow the path of your dreams in full expectation of the bounty that is certain to flow. This will bring you to your divine destination. This is what I mean by growing your destiny, Julian offered sagely. When I was a young boy, my father loved to read me a fairy tale known as Peter and the Magic Thread. Peter was a very lively little boy. Everyone loved him, his family, his teachers, and his friends. But he did have one weakness. What was that? Peter could never live in the moment. He had not learned how to enjoy the process of life. When he was in school, he dreamed of playing outside. When he was outside playing, he dreamed of his summer vacation. Peter constantly daydreamed, never taking the time to savor the special moments that filled his days. One morning, Peter was out walking in a forest near his home. Feeling flourish, that's it, isn't it? Even today, 27 years after she left us, while we were driving her to her best friend's birthday party, I would give anything just to hear my daughter giggle again, or to play hide and seek like we used to in our back garden. I would love to hold her in my arms and softly caress. When tired, he decided to rest on a patch of grass and eventually dozed off. After only a few minutes of deep sleep, he heard someone calling his name. Peter! Peter! came a shrill voice from above. As he slowly opened his eyes, he was startled to see a striking woman standing above him. She must have been well over a hundred years old, and her snow-white hair dangled well below her shoulders like a matted blanket of wool. In this woman's wrinkled hand was a magical little ball with a hole in the center of it, and out of the hole dangled a long, golden thread. Peter, she said, this is the thread of your life. If you pull the thread just a little bit, an hour will pass in seconds. If you pull a little harder, whole days will pass in minutes. And if you pull with all your might, months, even years, will pass by in days. Peter grew very excited at this discovery. 
I'd like to have it if I may, he asked. The elderly woman quickly reached down and gave the ball with the magic thread to the young boy. The next day, Peter was sitting in the classroom feeling restless and bored. Suddenly, he remembered his new toy. As he pulled a little bit of the golden thread, he quickly found himself at home, playing in his garden. Realizing the power of the magic thread, Peter soon grew tired of being a schoolboy and longed to be a teenager with all the excitement that this phase of life would bring. So again, he pulled out the ball and pulled hard on the golden thread. Suddenly, he was a teenager with a very pretty young girlfriend named Elise. But Peter still wasn't content. He had never learned to enjoy the moment and to explore the simple wonders of every stage of his life. Instead, he dreamed of being an adult. So again, he pulled on the thread and many years was by in an instant. Now he found he had been transformed into a middle-aged adult. Elise was now his wife, and Peter was surrounded with a house full of kids. But Peter also noticed something else. His once jet black hair had started to turn gray, and his once youthful mother, whom he loved so dearly, had grown old and frail. Yet Peter still could not live in the moment. He had never learned how to live in the now. So once again, he pulled on the magic thread and waited for the changes to appear. Peter now found that he was a 90-year-old man. His thick, dark hair had turned white as snow, and his beautiful young wife, Elise, had grown old and had passed away a few years earlier. His wonderful children had grown up and left home to lead lives of their own. And for the first time in his entire life, Peter realized he had not taken the time to embrace the wonders of living. He had never gone fishing with his kids or taken a moonlight stroll with Elise. He had never planted a garden or read those wonderful books his mother had loved to read. Instead, he had hurried through life, never resting to see all the good that was along the way. Peter became very sad at this discovery. He decided to go out to the forest where he used to love to walk as a young boy, to clear his head and warm his spirit. As he entered the forest, he noticed that the little saplings of his childhood had grown into mighty oaks. The forest itself had matured into a paradise of nature. He lay down on a small patch of grass and fell into a deep slumber. After only a minute, he heard someone calling out to him. Peter! Peter! cried the voice. He looked up in astonishment to see that it was none other than the old woman who had given him the ball with the magic golden thread many years earlier. Have you enjoyed my special gift? she asked. Peter was direct in his reply. At first it was fun, but now I hate it. My whole life has passed before my eyes without giving me the chance to enjoy it. Sure, there would have been sad times as well as great times, but I haven't had the chance to experience either. I feel empty inside. I've missed the gift of living. You are very ungrateful, said the old woman. Still, I will give you one last wish. Peter thought for an instant and then answered hastily. I'd like to go back to being a schoolboy and live my life over again. He then returned to his deep sleep. Again he heard someone calling his name and opened his eyes. Who could it be this time, he wondered. When he opened his eyes, he was absolutely delighted to see his mother standing over his bedside. She looked young, healthy, and radiant. Peter realized that the strange woman of the forest had indeed granted his wish, and he had returned to his former life. Hurry up, Peter. You sleep too much. Your dreams will make you late for school if you don't get up right this minute, his mother admonished. Needless to say, Peter dashed out of bed on this morning and began to live the way he had hoped. Peter went on to live a full life, one rich with many delights, joys, and triumphs. But it all started when he stopped sacrificing the present for the future and began to live in the moment. Today is your chance to awaken to the gift of living before it is too late, Julian continued. Let this new day be the defining moment of your life, the day that you make the decision once and for all to focus on what is truly important to you. Revive your spirit and start tending to your soul. This is the way to nirvana. Nirvana? The sages of Savana believed that the ultimate destination of all truly enlightened souls was a place called nirvana. Actually, more than a place, the sages believed nirvana to be a state, 
one that transcended anything they had known previously. In nirvana, all things were possible. There was no suffering, and the dance of life was played out with divine perfection. Julian, I promise you that the time you have spent with me will not be in vain. I will dedicate myself to living by the wisdom of the sages of Savannah, and I will keep my promise to you by sharing all that I have learned. I am speaking from the heart. I give you my word, I offered sincerely, feeling the throes of emotion stirring within. Spread the rich legacy of the sages to all those around you. They will quickly benefit from this knowledge and improve the quality of their lives, just as you will improve the quality of yours. And remember, the journey is to be enjoyed. The road is just as good as the end. I let Julian continue. Yogi Raman was a great storyteller, but there was one story he told me which stood out amongst the rest. May I share it with you? Absolutely. Many years ago, in ancient India, a Maharaja wanted to build a great tribute to his wife, 